Hi, listeners. This is the 80,000 Hours Podcast, the show about the world's most pressing problems and how you can use your career to solve them. I'm Rob Wiblin, Director of Research at 80,000 Hours. I listen to about 20 hours of audio on my phone each week, so I care a lot about making sure that I'm absorbing what I'm hearing as efficiently as possible. If you subscribe to podcasts on your phone app, then you'll almost certainly be able to customize the speed at which it plays each show. So it's not uh, so slow that you get bored, but also not so fast that you can't keep up. Many apps also let you chop out any silences, though personally I prefer to just let it play a little bit faster than cut out those silences because it changes the pacing. The densest podcasts I listen to are at about 1.2x speed, and the fluffiest ones at 2.3x or so. Personally, I use BeyondPod Podcast Manager on Android and have for about 10 years, but I hear the best podcast app for iPhones is called Overcast. When I'm not listening to podcasts, I use an app called Pocket, uh, which grabs articles from the internet for you to read on your phone later. Fortunately for me, it's able to read them to you from your phone, uh, because my hands get pretty sore if I have to keep scrolling down for hours at a time. It takes a while to get used to its style of reading uh, because its pronunciation isn't perfect, but after a few hours, I didn't have any trouble following it. If I'm listening to audiobooks rather than podcasts or articles, uh, I get them on Audible, though you're probably already well aware of that one. Regardless of what I'm listening to, I try to pay close attention to the speed so I don't waste time listening to something less quickly than I could actually handle, and you might like to do the same. I should also quickly apologize about the audio quality at the start of this episode, which is a bit worse than usual. Fortunately, I noticed I was recording on the wrong microphone a quarter of the way through, so it goes back to normal quality at about 36 minutes in. All right, here's Spencer. Today, I'm speaking with Spencer Greenberg, whose reviews uh, the first time around were so positive that he has the privilege of being the first guest on the show to be interviewed twice. Uh, Spencer is still an entrepreneur. And he founded Sparkwave, a startup foundry, which creates novel software products designed to solve problems in the world, such as scalable care for depression and tools for improving social science. He also founded clearerthinking.org, which offers free tools and training programs that have been used by over 150,000 people, which are designed to improve decision making and reduce biases in people's thinking, which is going to be a big topic of the conversation today. His background is in mathematics, and he has a PhD in applied math from NYU with a specialty in machine learning. Spencer's work has been featured in major media outlets such as the Wall Street Journal, The Independent, Lifehacker, Gizmodo, Fast Company, and the Financial Times, and I could have listed more, but I won't. So thanks for coming back on the podcast, Spencer. It's great to be here. Thanks so much for having me. So today we hope to talk about how to reason through difficult questions more accurately and assess evidence, and also uh, when we should expect to be overconfident and when to be underconfident. But first, uh, what have you been focused on in about the, the 10 months since we last spoke? Yeah, so things have been moving along with Sparkwave. Um, as you mentioned, we build new software products to try to solve problems in the world. If it's sufficiently promising, after we build the first version of the product, we'll recruit a CEO, ultimately with the goal of spinning out a new company. And so we actually have four portfolio companies right now where we build the first version of the product. We recruited a CEO. Um, so one of them is Uplift, which is our automated program for helping people with depression. We're trying to reduce depression symptoms. Uh, and that's run by Eddie Liu. And then we have uh, MindEase, which is trying to be the best software product in the world for calming you down when you're, when you're having significant anxiety. It's run by Peter Breitbart. Um, we have Clear Thinking, run by Aurora Quinn Elmore. And Positly, which is our recruitment platform for recruiting people for studies. It's run by Luke Freeman. Cool. Uh, so um, I think last time we talked about Uplift. How's that going? And when, when might people be expected to be able to use it? Things are going really well. You know, we have people using Uplift every week, but we're still in a closed beta because mm. we, we have some things we know we need to improve about the system. Almost done with that. We're going to release it really soon. So. Okay, nice. And uh, how are the other projects coming along? Uh, will we be able to see the results anytime in the next year or two? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I'm, I'm really excited about all four of these products. Uh, so Positly, we actually j- just got Positly up on Positly.com. It's basically the idea is trying to accelerate social science research by helping you recruit the right participants at the right time, get them to do the right thing. Um, so let's say you're, you're running a study, a scientific study, and you need 100 women aged 20 to 24, and maybe you want to divide them into groups and have them do different things and track them over time, have them fill out surveys at different points. That kind of research can be very complicated, expensive, time-consuming and difficult to get right. And we want to make things like that much, much easier to help accelerate people's work. And then also on the side of developing products, you know, if you look at why companies fail, the very commonly, probably the most common reason is they build a product that people don't really need or want. And so we think there's huge room for helping companies be better at releasing new valuable products by getting the data back from potential customers much earlier and more robustly. And so we want to help with that as well. 
Uh, how are you recruiting these people? Is this on Mechanical Turk? So the idea of the system is that eventually to have multiple backends mm -hmm. to help you get just the right participants you need. And whether you're weighing, you know, I want the cheapest sample possible really fast, or I want a representative national sample, or I want, you know, a sample from a specific place. But so we're going to be building out these different backends. So the first backend we have built out is Mechanical Turk, where we can layer a lot of really nice features on top of it to make it really nice for researchers. But then we'll be having these different backends coming for just getting the perfect sample for you. Yeah, and what's new with uh, Clear Thinking? Uh, so Clear Thinking, we have a lot of really exciting stuff happening. Uh, we, we have some long-term studies that we've been working on. Um, one is actually on creating happiness habits. And so this one I'm really excited about because I literally think it increased my happiness 5%. <laughs> Um, I know that's a bold claim and it's stuck now three or four months now, you know, fingers crossed. I don't know whether that'll last forever, but the idea of that, of that project is imagine that you had, let's say 30 happy thoughts a day that you wouldn't normally have. Like, what would that do to you? Hmm. You know, I think it's a reasonable hypothesis that if you actually had 30 extra happy thoughts throughout the day, it'd make you a happier person. So how do we make that happen? And so our idea was try to make that happen in the simplest way possible hmm. by installing a trigger in your life that already happens, let's say, 20 or 30 times a day, and making that trigger so strong associated with the happy thought that it actually triggers the happy thought. Yeah. And so for me, when we were developing the study and I was testing it, I, the trigger I set for myself was before I just check social media, when I have the thought of checking social media, I would think of something I'm grateful for. Mm -hmm. And it, it just worked to a crazy degree. I'm just way more grateful than I've ever been in my life, which is really <laughs> been a wonderful experience. So is this a bit of uh, temptation bundling? So well, maybe checking social media is a bit of a bad habit, but then you're bundling it with this thing that is like helpful to you? Well, I think of uh, temptation bundling a little different. I do okay. use temptation bundling. Yeah. It's also one of my favorite techniques. I use it to work out where basically I, there are TV shows I only let myself watch mm. if I'm actually working out while I'm doing it, mm. which is a motivator and like makes the working out feel more pleasant. But this is a little bit different. This is really about creating a trigger in your environment that triggers a certain type of thought. Um, and the really cool thing is that at first, it only would happen when I would like go to check social media. Right. Now it happens whenever I think about social media. And I often don't even go check it. I just have the thought, oh, wait, then I'm going to feel grateful. And then, you know, I don't even need to check the social media. So it's really cool. Okay. So uh, the, the goal is to think of something that you're grateful for. Uh, do you ever have difficulty doing that? So this is another funny thing mm. that happens psychologically. So at first, mm. I would every time think of something I'm grateful for. Mm. But then it started kind of getting like almost shorter and shorter until almost just like a happy mental maneuver. It's a little bit hard <laughs> to describe, but it's just sort of like this happy feeling that I like produce at that moment after having done it, you know, hundreds of repetitions of it. So we're going to be running a study on this technique mm. um, that's coming up soon. And then if we have good results, uh, the goal will be to turn into a tool so anyone can use the tool to try to create these happy associations to, you know, generate 20 or 30 more happy thoughts every day. Yeah. Uh, what kind of happy thoughts do you have? Are you, are you able to share them or? For me? Yeah. Oh, well, it really, for me, it started using, I used uh, gratefulness. So trying to think about all the things I have in my life. I have a funny way of doing gratitude that is especially effective for, for a certain type of people hmm. um, where I think of, the, uh, imagine myself not having the thing. And then I remind myself that I have it and I feel really great about that. But that technique doesn't necessarily generalize because I've, I've, I've showed that technique to some other people and they say, when I imagine not having it, it's like so crushing mm. that it doesn't necessarily work. But that's how I do it. So I'll be like, oh wow, you know, tea exists in the world. That's such a wonderful <laughs> thing. And then I'll contrast that, imagine tea didn't exist and it was impossible to get tea. And then I'm like, oh, but there is tea and that makes me feel really good, so. Yeah, after we spoke last time, I, I tried out the, the Uplift uh, app. I managed to get a link to, to this closed beta, and it was it was really good. Unfortunately, I, I became happier uh, after a couple of weeks of using it, so I so I didn't manage to complete the course. I'm but. really I'm really glad to hear that. Not necessarily <laughs> causal, but it, regardless of whether it's causal, I'm really glad to hear that, that you're feeling happy. So. Yeah, so um, I, I mean, I thought it was a very good material, and um, I was kind of thing easy actually to motivate myself to to do it because it was yeah it had all these like entertaining explanations and examples through it. So uh, as as soon as um that goes public. Uh, I think I'll announce it on the show and encourage people to, to give it a crack. That's great. All right. Let's move on to uh, a talk you gave at EA Global uh, last week on intrinsic values and instrumental values, where you did a big survey uh, trying to figure out what do people uh, actually uh, value for its own sake. Um, what did you find there? Yeah, so this is a topic I've been thinking about a lot lately. So first, let me try to define an intrinsic value. So there are many things we all value, like you know, money, food, etc. But most of the things we value, we only value for their effects. And so you can imagine something and say, do I value it? And then if the answer is yes, you can say to yourself, well, would I continue to value it even if it got me nothing else, even if there were no effects? 
and if so, it's an intrinsic value. Or another way of putting that is an intrinsic value is something you value for its own sake, not for the effects that it has. And so for many people, like their own pleasure is an intrinsic value, uh, but money is not an intrinsic value because money, if it, if it couldn't get us any effects, like let's say there was hyperinflation, it was worthless, like we wouldn't care about money at all. Okay. Uh, and so who did you survey? Uh, we ran a survey where we got a, a bunch of different participants, some of them uh, effective altruists who fully identify, some of them partially identified effective altruists and some of them non-effective altruists. Uh, and across kind of, we looked at it four different variables, at age, um, how liberal conservative people are, gender, and whether they identify as effective altruists. And we, we looked at what intrinsic values people report having. Mm -hmm. And this was a very challenging study to run because it's very hard to, to, first of all, get people to understand exactly what an intrinsic value is, but it's even harder to get them to kind of do the proper mental maneuver of, of assessing whether they value a thing even if it doesn't have any effects. So all those results, you definitely have to take them with a grain of salt, keeping in mind that it's tough to get people to really do this properly. Yeah, uh, so you had some checks at the beginning of the, of the survey, right, to, to see whether people had understood, and then you tried to exclude people who didn't, who didn't get the, what the questions actually meant. Exactly, we excluded a lot of participants because basically we gave them, we taught them about intrinsic values, then we gave them a quiz to make sure they understood it, and if they got more than one question wrong in the quiz, we excluded them, and then we actually had them state in their own words what intrinsic value is, and we read all of those, and, and if, if they seemed incompatible with our definition of intrinsic values, we also excluded them. So we excluded a lot of participants uh, before analyzing the data, uh, but even still, you know, you still have to take it with a grain of salt. But yes, we, we tried hard to make the data as valid as we could. Okay, so what were the, what were the main findings from the, from the study? Yeah, so we looked at which intrinsic values were associated with different groups of people. Um, so I'll just give you some examples. So for conservatives, we found that they tended to report our intrinsic value around religion and things like retribution, where you know, those who've done bad things get punishment for it, and also the preservation of existing values. Which makes a lot of sense because to some people that's really what conservative means, mm. kind of preservation of values. Uh, on the other hand, people who record being liberal, they tend to value things like animal well-being, nature, and the happiness of strangers. Uh, now I should point out what, what we're looking at here are the things that differentiated each group. In other words, not the things necessarily that conservatives value the highest and liberals value the highest, but the things that they, they that differentiate them from all other groups. What was groups. distinctive. Exactly. Mm. Exactly. So we also looked at females versus males. Females reported intrinsic values around kindness or caring, diversity, and human freedom more often. Males reported ones around their own selfish interests, the interests of people they know personally, uh, and, the, and also around the pleasure of strangers. When going to older versus younger, we found that older people reported intrinsic values around being cared about or trusted, also about society's morality in general. Younger people around things like animal lifespans and that they themselves are admired and also that the people they know have pleasure. Um, and finally, looking at effective altruists versus non-effective altruists, they really found a very clear pattern. Effective altruists tend to value the happiness and suffering of all conscious beings. And that was really the big differentiator from other groups. Yeah, you, uh, I think you broke them into universal and non-universal values. Is that right? Were you, things that are like um, not specifically about your life or about people you know, and ones that were specifically like either you or people you know or things about your own life. Exactly. Like I, I like to categorize intrinsic values into three groups: <clears throat> self uh, ones that are like my own pleasure, things like that. Then there's community ones, which are about people that are special to you. Yeah. So either people from your in group or people who are your friends or whatever. And then the universal ones are all the others. They're they, they don't, they're not necessarily about people, but they could be about people. They could say, I care about the suffering of all conscious beings, yeah. or it could be, I care about there being beautiful things in the world, right? Yeah. And what did you find that? Well, well, one of the interesting things is that most people actually did report having at least one universal intrinsic value. And mm -hmm. so, and I think that's kind of interesting because universal intrinsic values are a reason for people who don't know each other, potentially mm -hmm. people even on the other sides of the world from each other to cooperate and work together because there's something they care about that's not about themselves, not about the people they know personally, uh, and they can kind of collaborate. And I think, you know, one way to think about effective altruism is it's people that have uh, universal intrinsic value around uh, reducing suffering in the world, increasing well-being, getting together to figure out how to do that. How do we all work together to increase that? Yeah. So I guess uh, we've talked about some of the differences, but just like what, what are the uh, just boring findings? That, what, what, are, what are the most people care about? So if we look at people who don't identify as effective altruists, uh, we found that 82% of them reported that I love other people as intrinsic value, kind of interesting, that I myself feel happy, it was 74%, not too surprising, uh, that I continue to care about other people, 74%, uh, that beautiful things continue to exist, 71%, um, that per people I know personally feel happy, uh, 69%. So not necessarily super surprising, but this is there's a long list of these that a lot of people report as intrinsic values. Now, maybe they're making a mistake, 
uh, maybe they're misunderstanding their intrinsic values, but I think it's at least keep, uh, worth keeping an open mind that maybe people actually do kind of intrinsically value these things. Hmm. Um, and one thing, one way to think about that, like what is really going on here is that if we think of our brain as a machine, one of the operations that our machine brains have is this, I value this thing operation, right? And so it, it isn't necessarily that strange or surprising to say there might be quite a lot of different ideas or concepts or things that our brain does this, like, I find this value operation, even when you remove all the effects of that thing. Yeah. So, for example, uh, we've got uh, 71% of people, or at least people who didn't identify as effective altruists, valuing uh, the beautiful thing continue to exist. Do you think that uh, you'd get that high number if you said that beautiful things continue to exist, but nobody sees them, which kind of seems like it should be a requirement if, if you're ruling out any, any, any impacts that it has? Uh, that's, that's a really good question. Um, I think that I imagine that probably would reduce the number because it would cause people like second guess and, and double mm-hmm. think about their, about that as intrinsic value. But interestingly enough, I know two people who are very savvy, you know, philosophically, mm-hmm. And introspective, they both claim that beautiful things existing, even if nobody sees them, are actual intrinsic values. And I've like had this debate with them. They're like, no, 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 I get it. I actually value these things, even if it's on an alien world that that no, no conscious sees. beings will ever see. So you know, I think I think what we're really getting at here, is, though, is a psychological thing, right? Yeah. It's it, um, I'm making uh, when I'm talking about intrinsic values, I'm talking about a psychological phenomenon. I'm not talking about like some universal truth. Um, and so there isn't necessarily a wrong answer to what some intrinsic values could be. Yeah. So uh, what did effective altruists uh, tend, tend to value? Yeah. So, uh, you know, as you could uh, very much imagine, effective altruists tended to value things around kind of the suffering and happiness of conscious beings. But they also about 84 percent of them said that uh, the people I know personally feeling happy is an intrinsic value. It makes a lot of sense. Eighty one percent the animals uh, feel happy. Eighty um, percent that I suffer less than I do normally. So I think this is really interesting because I think as a community, if you look at kind of the, the, what is unique about the effective altruism community with regard to intrinsic values, like, I mean, there's a lot of unique things about it, but with, mm-hmm. with regard to intrinsic values, I think it, it really is about how much the, the effective altruism community values the suffering and, and well-being of all, of all conscious beings. Mm-hmm. But if you look at effective altruists individually, many of them that have, report, at least report, mm-hmm. having other intrinsic values. In fact, many intrinsic values. So it's, it, you get a much broader view that maybe you lose when you're kind of staring at the community as a whole. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Were there any uh, non-welfare things that effective altruists were, were particularly interested in? Um, I think that effective altruists, said, quite a few of them said that they continue to learn being an intrinsic value. Uh, another, yeah, 40% said the people I know are able to get the things they want. That's a little bit of like a preference satisfaction thing. 33% said that humanity is not engaged in immoral acts. So that's kind of interesting. Hmm. Interesting. Okay, so they, they might have kind of a justice uh, conception. So even if, the, if there's like injustice is being perpetrated, even if they don't affect welfare, they might be against it. Yeah. So were there any uh, really surprising results? Uh, maybe that made you question whether the methodology worked. Well, you know, I, I definitely take you know, like I said, definitely take this with a grain of salt. Mm-hmm. Like I was pretty surprised by the number of people reporting beauty being a value, mm-hmm. um, and you know, it does make me wonder whether people <laughs> uh, fully interpreting it properly. Um, but I think this exercise of trying to figure out your own intrinsic values is a really useful thing to do. Hmm. Um, I actually see five reasons to try to figure your own intrinsic values out. Yeah, go for it. Um, if you want me to jump into that. Yeah. So the, the first reason I think it can be useful to figure out your own intrinsic values has to do with what I call value traps and trying to avoid them. And a value trap is when you associate something with an intrinsic value because it used to be associated, or maybe you just had the false belief that it was, and then you pursue the thing without actually getting the intrinsic value out of it. Um, so an example of this might be maybe when you were young, like not having that much money, reduce your autonomy. So you associate having money with autonomy. So you end up going to a career where you make tons of money, but you work so many hours, you actually have very little autonomy, but you continue doing it because you have inertia and you don't really pay attention to the fact that it's not getting you the intrinsic value you were seeking. So, and I think this is actually like shockingly common how often we kind of do these things that were like vaguely associated with intrinsic value, but don't get the intrinsic value out of it. Yeah. Do you think actually, uh, people by association end up valuing the thing terminally. So, so you wanted to get this job because you thought it would have particular consequences, but then it just becomes so hooked in with your mind uh, as, as something that you've desired and worked towards that, in fact, you do just end up valuing it for its own sake. Because this is a psychological phenomenon, I certainly can't say for sure that people couldn't come to value it intrinsically. But I think usually what happens is they just aren't making a careful distinction between intrinsic and non-instrumental yeah, instrumental values. And so what happens is because they're not making that distinction – 
they just keep pursuing the thing because they think it's valuable, it's valuable, it's valuable. But if you actually force them to do the thought experiment, you're like, really? Do you think that money is inherently <laughs> valuable, even if it's useless? So they'd be like, no, probably not. And then they, they would start like separate out that value and realize it's not intrinsic value. Do you have any examples from your own life where uh, you got a uh, confused terminal and instrumental value? Well, you know, I think that as someone who loves learning, I think it can be easy. And I think I've made this mistake of like viewing learning as good in and of itself. Mm. And I think learning actually can be kind of a dangerous trap in that way. Mm. Because for, there's something about the wiring of many people that where you're learning and you feel like you're making progress, mm. right? But maybe you're learning something that's useless. Maybe you're learning something that's even wrong. Mm. But your brain doesn't care, right? You're learning. You're feeling good. You like you're improving. Stimulation. It's, sti- it's, it's stimulation, but it's also like if you're playing a video game, at least you know you're not doing something productive. <laughs> when you're learning, you kind of like you may be doing something unproductive, but it feels productive. And it's, yeah. that's actually kind of like the worst kind of nonproductive activity, right? Yeah, that's interesting. I, I do know some people who say that they value learning for its own sake, even if it has no, no positive consequences. Absolutely. And quite a few people in this survey said that. I don't think that I value it for its own sake. I think I value it because of the effects it has. Yeah, I'm the same. And, and uh, I, I put to them, what if you just had a bunch of true facts that were stored on a hard disk somewhere that no one ever actually plugged in? Like, in a sense, there's more like knowledge in the universe encoded somewhere. But it, uh, in that case, it's very explicit that it has no effects on you know, any kind Yeah, I imagine that's a good intuition pump. Yeah. And there's the thing about intrinsic values. We have to use these intuition pumps to like, mm to do these thought experiments carefully yeah. and our intrinsic values will kind of shift as we do thought experiments. And, and so for example, when you start considering scope, right, mm. you, you know, you imagine one person suffering, you're like, that's, that's bad. And you imagine 10 people suffering, that's worse. A thousand people suffering, a million people suffering. And like, at first I think people like, will be like, yeah, that's worse and worse, but their intuitive feeling won't be like, it will almost be, be as though a million people suffering is only slightly worse than one person suffering, which mm. is clearly, you know, when you think about it, you're like, no, 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 it's way, way, way worse. And that is kind of an intuition, intuition pump that I think it's a lot of people thinking, caring more about suffering and realizing mm. that value of suffering is kind of almost like a, it's a, sort of an unbounded value in the sense that like there can be so much potential for suffering um, that it can be a value that's like becomes extremely important. Yeah. Whereas other ones like maybe about personal self-interest are kind of more bounded in a way. Yeah. Okay. So that's the, that's the first reason to, to worry about this distinction. That's, uh, what's, what's number two? So number two is, is for helping us plan. Um, so sometimes when we think about something as being like a good thing to do, like we, something we want, but we don't carefully think about like, what is the intrinsic value we're getting out of it? And we make a kind of really inefficient plan to get the intrinsic value. Uh, so for example, imagine that you have this, you really want to understand the universe, but, and that's a kind of intrinsic value of yours. Uh, and you associate that with being a tenured professor because tenured professors can like sit around and think a lot about the way things work. And so you decide to become a tenured professor and you have this like really crazy, like 15 year plan of how you're going to get there and you start pursuing it. But if you'd noticed that the main thing you, main reason you were drawn to that was for the intrinsic value, you may have been able to make a much more efficient plan, like just on your free time, study the way things work. Hmm. And maybe that would have achieved most of the intrinsic value without this 15 year plan. Um, and so this goes to the idea of like goal factoring. It's sometimes taught like Center for Applied Rationality type workshops. Yeah. Do you just want to uh, quickly describe goal factoring? So the idea of goal factoring is that um, if you, if you think about how you're going to try to achieve a goal, and then you think about why you want to achieve the goal. Once you've broken that down, you can then start considering like, okay, I'm trying to achieve this goal for reasons A, B, and C. Can I come up with another plan that might get me A, B, and C also, but is maybe a better way to do it than my original plan of how to get there? Yeah. I guess shockingly often you find that uh, you weren't accomplishing the goal in the most, most uh, direct way. Exactly, exactly. And then, so I think that's one of the benefits of understanding intrinsic values because the intrinsic values are sort of like the end nodes of your value system. Mm-hmm. So they're like... You know, those are the things you're in some sense trying to get according to your own value system. And so if you don't, if you don't know what those are, it can be hard to make efficient plans. Yeah. What, why do you think it is that humans are kind of by design seem to get fixated on intermediate nodes uh, rather than like thinking through about what they're trying to accomplish ultimately and then, then going directly there? It's an interesting question. Um, I think that the human brain just doesn't clearly differentiate between value and intrinsic value. Mm. So it blurs those two things together and it kind of makes sense because once you, like, okay, so getting food, very, very useful for survival, right? The fact that it's not an intrinsic value, if that was demotivating to humans, that might not be great for survival, right? It's like very important we try to get food. Food is not the end goal, but, but like, you know, the fact that the brain treats it as an end goal all the time, it kind of makes sense, right? Yeah. So it's a lot of the time it doesn't, it doesn't matter too much, but then sometimes it causes you to go really astray when you haven't. Yeah. Yeah. Every once in a while it causes you to like spend your entire life doing something pointless because <laughs> you never clearly separated what your, your intrinsic values from your other values. Right. 
Yeah, I wonder if, well, one thing would just be maybe our brains are just like not that great and they make, they make kind of random errors or they just like don't reflect uh, sufficiently. Another one might be that the environment's changed such that, uh, you know, uh, our ancestors, their environment was more simple and they didn't have to spend a lot of time reflecting on uh, terminal or yeah, um, instrumental versus um, intrinsic values. Whereas these days, uh, our, our plans tend to be more complicated, have more steps, um, yeah, more intermediate uh, outputs. And so uh, now we need to reflect more on this kind of system two uh, level about uh, whether actually accomplishing the thing that we ultimately want. I think that's a good point. And I would also say there are a lot of things that cause human behavior mm. that are not intrinsic values, right? Mm. Habits, for example, or reward and punishment through the mechanism of operant conditioning, mm. um, automatic like biological responses. So there are many things that drive our behavior. I think of intrinsic values as like one of these drivers of behavior. And the way, I, the metaphor I like to use is like intrinsic values are kind of like a beacon shining off in the distance. And like most of the time you're, you know, you're in your boat and you're just focused on rowing and you're trying to dodge the waves that are hitting the boat. But like every once in a while, you kind of look out and you're like, where am I trying to get to again? Why am I <laughs> rowing in the first place? Mm. And am I, am I headed in the right direction? And that's like when the kind of role intrinsic values play. All right. That's, uh, that's number two. What's number three? So number three is that I think understanding your intrinsic values can help you better understand and handle a kind of social guilt that's pretty common where, you know, we all are exposed to the values of other people, you know, our parents growing up, our community, our current friends and so on. And when those, when their intrinsic values are different than our own, it can create this really weird feelings. But it's like everyone else around you really values this thing and you don't really value it that much. Maybe you really value this other thing that they don't value. And so you start feeling like, oh, there's something wrong with me. I'm an imposter. Maybe I'm a bad person. Maybe you feel guilt. Um, an example of this might be like, you know, your parents expect you to have such and such career, but that career doesn't get you the things that you intrinsic value. value. And so like, what's wrong with you? You know, why are you a bad child or whatever? Mm -hmm. And so I think once you reframe this in the, in the view of intrinsic values, and you're like, wait a minute. So my parents have these intrinsic values. My friends have these and I have these. It just helps you understand it and, and potentially feel much less guilty and just kind of be like, okay, this is what's happening. Um, and it can actually, I think, potentially help you relate better to those communities as well. Okay. Yeah, I completely agree. What's, what's number four? Uh, so number four, so on subtle, is I think understanding your intrinsic values can help you avoid a kind of strange double think that I think sometimes occurs. And the double think is around when you are, it's related to the last one, actually. It's when you think that you're only supposed to have certain intrinsic values, but you actually have others. Mm. Um, so I've seen this happen in two ways. The first way is that you believe there's an objective truth about what's valuable. Like maybe you're convinced of some philosophical theory of morality mm. and you think the only thing that's valuable is, is what that says, like utilitarianism, for example. Mm. The other way I see it happen is the people around you in your social circle, they only accept, you know, as a community, accept certain intrinsic values, mm. right? So you, so you think I'm only supposed to have certain intrinsic values, but you actually have other ones. Mm. And so what you try to do is you try to recast your other intrinsic values in terms of these ones that are acceptable or valid. Yeah. And an example of this would be when someone says something like, well, the reason I cultivate friendship is because it makes me more effective. Mm. And I think what's going on there very often is a kind of self-deception uh, where people feel like they're not supposed to have these intrinsic values. So they kind of trick themselves into thinking that they don't have other intrinsic values. And this leads to what I think is a really important and subtle point that whatever you believe is objectively true about value in the universe and whatever you believe is like the right values you're supposed to have according to your social group. Mm -hmm those things are like independent from what your current intrinsic values are. Mm. Like your current intrinsic values is like a psychological fact. Like a scientist could study your intrinsic values and answer the question. It's a fact about yourself. It's not a fact about the universe. Mm. And it's, I think it's very important to like draw that distinction and say, you might believe in objective moral truth and you may believe you figured out what it is, but it doesn't mean that's what your intrinsic values are right now. Maybe you aspire to make your intrinsic values match that more closely, mm. but they're probably not there yet. And if you don't draw that distinction, you might end up having this very bizarre kind of double think where you like basically deceive yourself and creates these weird psychological effects, potentially harmful. Yeah. So I think I often hear people say that, uh, you know, the reason I'm uh, just having fun or I'm going on holiday, I'm not actually trying, I'm not actually working to improve the world right now. It's just so like, I don't burn out or yeah. yeah. So, okay. Well, one thing is, yeah. So, so you get these explanations like, uh, cause so I don't burn out. So it'll be, uh, it'll be, you uh, like be able to work even harder later on. Sometimes that's true. Sometimes it's not, but I very often hear people just say, I oh, know it's because of weakness of will, or it's like, you know, I, I, on some level, I wish that I wasn't doing this. Uh, 
but but in practice, I you know can't actually make myself uh, work all the time, or I'm just I just actually just don't care enough about the world to to, to work that hard. Um, but it sounds like you're like you've seen a lot of people in your social group just like they try to trick themselves every time that it's it's always for some greater good. I, I definitely I definitely have seen this, and I think this is something the EA community is especially mm. susceptible to mm. is this not drawing clear distinctions between these like my intrinsic values versus what I think my intrinsic values should be versus what I think the universal truth about intrinsic values are. And those are different things. And you should, uh, you should understand that. And like one way to recast that, like, Oh, I'm going to go on vacation is like, Oh, I have an intrinsic value of like my own happiness. And, Mm -hmm. and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. And just trying but like being in denial of that fact doesn't make it go away. If you actually want to change your intrinsic values, you just want to know where you're at and then think about what you want them to be rather than pretend that they're already there. Yeah. I mean, I would say, I do, uh, as a brain, I uh, value my own welfare uh, yeah. more highly than other people. And I don't think that that's good. Nonetheless, I make peace with that and uh, pursue my own interest uh, to, to a reasonable degree. Um, and I don't feel bad about it because I don't think that's going to help. Yeah. And I personally, I think it's healthy to say I have a bunch of intrinsic values. Yeah. Some of them are about helping the world. Let me support those values by like devoting a certain amount of my efforts to really doing the best I can at promoting that universal intrinsic value of reducing suffering or increasing well-being or whatever it is. And then I also have these other intrinsic values, which I balance against that, you know, so I'm not willing to like necessarily utterly destroy myself for my universal intrinsic value, but I'm willing to work really hard for a long time and, yeah. you know, make it a big part of my life or that kind of thing. And I think that's like a healthy way to try to balance it. Yeah, I agree. All right. What's number five? So the, the fifth and final reason why I think it can be useful to understand our intrinsic values is I think it can help us when we're thinking about the vision of the world we want to create. Because it's pretty easy to say, like, on the margin ways we can make the world better. Like, there was less disease, less poverty, less suffering. I think most people would agree that's good. But when we actually start thinking about what world do we want to make? Like, if we could, you know, if in hundreds of years humanity makes a new world, what do we want that world to look like? Mm -hmm. And as soon as you start, like, trying to, like, describe that world, weird things happen. First of all, if that world is built on just, like, one or two intrinsic values, a lot of times that world will sound unappealing even to yourself, even if you think that those are your like only or prominent intrinsic values. Hmm. Um, second of all, it would probably sound even less appealing to other people. And who so we don't share those values or weight them as highly. Exactly. And so I think if we're, you know, if we're trying to make a world that like generally bro- is broadly appealing and lots of people will want to be in and we ourselves even will want to really be in and we'll think of it as optimal. We have to really consider multiple intrinsic values and try to build a world that like has this complex set of, of intrinsic values that it supports. Otherwise, you're building a world for just like a small subset of people. Um, and, and a classic example of this is that, you know, if you're hedonic utilitarian, mm-hmm. you know, by some forms of, of logic, people come to the conclusion that the best world is like just hook everyone up to a happiness machine, right? Mm. But mo- I think a lot of people, even hedonic util- people who think of themselves as hedonic utilitarians, actually don't think that that's the best world, Yeah. right? Like even according to what they think of as their value system, right? Yeah, I guess I, I do. Or I would put myself in happiness machine if uh, there wasn't um, like any, anything useful that I could do. Uh, and, I, and I would recommend that to other people. Um, what if what if some people didn't want to be in it though? Yeah, so then, then I think I wouldn't force them uh, for right. uh, like... Pragmatic reasons, uh, potentially, but not because yeah. you value their preferences. No, that's right. Yeah, interesting. Um, uh, at least not in just. Well, I suppose moral uncertainty is another thing. But uh, I think like uh, the second thing that I came the most about after um, welfare is um, autonomy. Well, that so autonomy, I think, is a reason not to yeah. push people to be in some situation they don't want. Yeah. So that's not saying like I'd recommend it to them, um, but but I wouldn't uh, ever require anyone to. But it's it's interesting that. Uh, like if if you do have this view that there are kind of objectively valuable things um, that and that people can be mistaken about what's valuable, then you might want to go for quite an extreme uh, future or, or in a future that's not appealing to everyone. And then I guess you would, in, in reality you'd want to compromise with everyone uh, because you, you don't have like total, total power over the future, and, right. and, and you get better. You get you get uh, well, everyone gets more if you um, compromise rather than fight. Uh, uh, absolutely. So there's the pragmatic reasons to compromise so that we can all work together. Um, there's also moral uncertainty reasons like, yeah. well, OK, so you think this is the only good thing, but are you sure? Yeah. Right. Philosophers don't think so. You know, mm-hmm. I think what, like a quarter of them are consequential or something. I don't remember the exact yeah, number. Like a quarter or third or something. Yeah. Like yeah. So there's a lot of disagreement about these yeah. things. So I think that's a really good reason. So uh, compromise is a good reason to include multiple intrinsic values. Mm-hmm. Moral uncertainty is a good reason to include multiple intrinsic values. Mm-hmm. But also if you don't believe in an objective moral truth. Yeah. Yet you still claim that the only thing that matters is, let's say, utility. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm a little confused because like, are you telling, if you don't think there's objective moral truth, in what sense is that the only thing that matters? Well, it's definitely not, you're definitely not describing your brain because that's mm-hmm. not the way human brains work. Human brains have multiple intrinsic values in my view. 
So it, it seems like there's some people who don't believe that there are objective answers to, to what's intrinsically valuable. Um, and it's true that in their own life, they will uh, weight their own uh, welfare uh, more highly and things like that, just because of like, you know, how humans are as a species. But then when it comes to like much more abstract cases or cases where kind of resources aren't limiting or they've like, they've changed their own, or they've like made their own life and their friends' lives kind of good in the normal way that are for humans, which isn't only considering uh, welfare, mm -hmm. then in the much broader picture, they're willing to, uh, I guess, um, work towards a much stranger world where you, where you optimize only for particular things that they think are valuable in the abstract. Uh, and I guess... Yeah, for those people, it's not clear that they're, that they're making a mistake. It, it's true. Yeah, if, if they think about their own future, what, what future would they create for them personally? It would be probably a lot more human than like uh, a happiness machine. Uh, but then when they're thinking about, you know, what should I turn rocks into? It might look more like a happy, happiness machine. Yeah, well, you know, the way I explain this is, is, well, first of all, people can be convinced that certain things are objectively valuable. And if they're convinced of that, they might try to maximize that thing. Yeah. Uh, I worry about that. Because I think, I think there's a, for the reasons mentioned that, mm. that, that's potentially dangerous to just focus on one intrinsic value. Mm. But if they don't believe in objective moral truth, then really what are they doing? Like in some sense, what is there to do other than re reflect on your own intrinsic values? Cause you don't believe there's anything out there. So all there is is to like examine what's here in your mind. Mm. And when you do that, I think that, and I think my data also hints at this, mm. you get really a complex system of intrinsic values. There's a lot of different things that people seem to value and they include things like, People getting what they want, people not suffering, mm. justice, and all and all kinds of other things. And I think you know when once people so so not all of those in, uh, intrinsic values will drive people to the same degree, right? Mm. One person may be more driven by their own happiness, another person may be more driven by the happiness of their, of their community, and a third person might be more driven by the happiness of all beings, right? Mm. So so even if they, even if all three of those people actually had the same intrinsic values, they might be, have different strengths of like how driven they are by those values. Okay, so let's move on to another study that you've done uh, about overconfidence this time. Uh, what was that about? Yeah, so this is a really new result. We've been working on it for a while, but, but kind of just coming together into a final result. And we're looking at whether we can predict on what sort of skills people tend to be overconfident when rating themselves relative to others. And we've actually done a series of three studies to try to get this result. It's pretty, pretty complicated to try to produce. Um, one of the studies, we had each person evaluate out of 100 people of their own age and gender who live in their area, how many of those 100 people do they think they'd be better than at some particular skill? Mm -hmm. And so we have them rate 100 such skills, and then we can look for each skill, what is the average rating people give? So so if on average they think they're better than only 30 out of 100, that suggests that maybe people would be underconfident at that skill, where if mm -hmm. on average they rate themselves 70 out of 100, maybe people are, are overconfident at that skill. Okay, uh, so you were looking at in which cases they're overconfident, in which cases they're underconfident? Exactly, we want to be able to predict. Hmm. And so I want to give you guys a little quiz now. Right. I'm going to read you a few skills. And these are some where we found pretty strong findings either in either the overconfidence or underconfidence direction. See if you can guess which one people are, which ones are overconfident versus underconfident. I actually don't know the results, so I can actually guess blind. Yeah. Great. Okay. You ready? Yeah, go for it. All right. So knitting a sweater, are people mm -hmm. overconfident or underconfident? Yeah. I'm going to guess that few people have done that and they're going to, think, well, I, I don't know anything about knitting and they're probably going to be underconfident, actually. That's right. We found them yeah. who are underconfident. Um, how about thinking critically? Uh, I think that too many, almost everyone thinks that they're like more rational and more, more intelligent than other people, so they're going to be overconfident. People, yeah, we're way overconfident. So about the people rated themselves as better than about hmm. 71 out of 100 people Okay, at that on average. Okay. Um, how about lifting 10 pounds? So this was a bit vague. We, you know, we didn't specify what it means to be good at lifting 10 pounds. But lifting 10 yeah. pounds. Uh, I think people will be appropriately confident because they're going to be just be baffled by what this is. People report themselves being better than 71 out of 100 people at lifting 10 pounds. What, so. does, that, what does that even mean? Well, <laughs> there is one theory that uh, when there's ambiguity, people mm. tend to use the ambiguity to their advantage to okay. like interpret it in a way that makes them look good. We didn't necessarily find that as a result, but that yeah. is one theory that's out there in the academic world about okay. how people deal with ambiguity. All right. Um, here's another one, uh, running a marathon. Uh, I think most people are going to imagine that running a marathon is very unpleasant and that they haven't done it. On the other hand, they might think that everyone else is terrible at running marathons too. All right. Appropriately confident. We found people yeah. were underconfident. Unconfident. And, and you know, this is, I think, a, an interesting topic because a lot of people have heard that people are overconfident. People are overconfident. But actually, it's not true universally. There are things people seem to be underconfident in. And so we did find that out of these hundred skills that people tended to be overconfident, not underconfident. But there still were quite a few that people were underconfident. And so that, that was pretty interesting. 
Yeah. So kind of, was there any unifying theme for what things people are overconfident and underconfident about? Yeah. So we actually looked at what traits of a skill are predictive of a person rating, uh, of people rating themselves as being overconfident or underconfident in that skill. Hmm. And we did this by looking at having people rate the specific, how many people out of a hundred they'd be better than at the scale. Hmm. But we also actually ran another study where we had people do the skill. And so we could actually see whether they truly were overconfident or underconfident, um, compared to their prediction. Hmm. And there we, we, so we analyzed all that data. And we actually looked for variables about a skill that were predictive in both cases. Hmm. In other words, when people were rating themselves in the abstract relative to other people, but also when they were rel- when they were actually going to then do the skill and we could actually measure it. And we actually were able to find five different traits about a skill that seemed predictive in both cases of whether someone's going to be over or underconfident. Yeah, what were they? So the first one is how good people think they are at the skill on average. Like, mm. so if it's a skill that a lot of people say they're good at, then people tend to be overconfident mm. in, in our data. A second one is whether people feel that the thing is something that is a matter of personal opinion, like whether you're mm. good at it is a matter of personal opinion, right? So maybe like writing a novel, like how good you are might be a matter of personal opinion, whereas maybe, you know, um, throwing a dart at a dartboard, maybe there's more objective matter of whether, you know, you're hitting the dartboard. Well, I mean, in that case, actually, everyone could say that they're better than average and be right by their own lights because they have a different sense of what it is to be good at that particular skill. Yeah. And I think that's right. And that goes to that ambiguity point when, when it's ambiguous, maybe, maybe the people are using that, um, to kind of say that they're good at the thing. Yeah. Um, the third trait we found is, how experienced people say they are on average of doing the thing. Strangely, potentially, you might think it's strange, as people reported being more experienced, we found that they tend to be more overconfident in the thing. Fourth, how much people say that the activity reflects someone's personality or character. Hmm. You know, so like maybe the skill is like making friends. So maybe, and people might hmm. think that is really has to do with your personality and character. So they might be more overconfident. Whereas like maybe like rolling a bowling ball, hmm. maybe people think that's less to do with your personality and character. Maybe they're less overconfident. So if, if it's about their personality, then they tend to be more overconfident if, if, if they view it as more a core aspect of who they are. Exactly. Mm. And finally, um, how difficult people think the thing is. So mm. if they rate the thing as being very difficult, this is the one that goes in the reverse direction. Yeah. If they think the thing is very difficult, they tend to be underconfident. So that kind of explains the marathon. Yeah, exactly. So if you think about the marathon one, people might think it's difficult, which could cause them to be uh, underconfident. Um, they may not view it as part of their personality or character, potentially, so that that... That could explain why they might be underconfident. Um, people are not experienced, so that could explain why they're, they're mm. underconfident. They might say it's not a matter of personal opinion, so that mm. could explain why they're overconfident, underconfident, yeah. and so on. So you see the marathon one lines up pretty well with like a bunch of these traits, actually, to explain why people might be underconfident. And what about the knitting one? Yeah, it's an interesting question. Um, you know, I don't know. So I, I've gone through and like for a bunch of the ones that had the most extreme results, yeah. scored them on these five traits. And mm. the, and just from that, like very simple way of doing it, the five traits do a pretty good job at the extremes. Yeah. You know, I'm not going to say that these are like, if you know these five traits of a skill, you're going to be super accurate, mm. but they do seem to be like significantly correlated with mm. whether people are under or overconfident from our, from our data, at least. Well, okay. So with the knitting one, uh, people don't have much experience with it. Maybe they regard it as kind of hard because they don't even know, they wouldn't know how to begin. Uh, and they also presume most people would not view knitting as a core part of their personality. So those things push in the direction of being underconfident. Right. Um, so there's a pretty big literature on overconfidence and overplacement, uh, right? Uh, so how, how does this gel with the broader literature? Well, we started out looking at the literature and trying to take traits that they found, but we weren't getting the R squares that we wanted. Hmm. So we weren't getting, so in other words, we took a few traits from the literature that, that, that people had said were correlated with whether someone's under or overconfident. And then we ran our first study and we just didn't get it good, the strong correlations we were hoping for. So then we went back and we just cast a really wide net. We tried to come up with all the traits we could through brainstorming. We actually crowdsourced other people's ideas about oh. what traits might predict under our comments. We came up with a list of, I think, 21 different traits. Hmm. And then we just ran them all and tried to use large enough data sets that we could really afford to check all of them. And that's where we got this list of five. So that's where, where it comes oh. from. You must have had a huge sample to, to have enough and also a lot of different tasks that to, to get enough of variety across these five well, characteristics. Yeah. So one of our studies, we had 10 different tasks that mm-hmm. people were doing and we actually had them do the task so we could measure how performant they were and we had to predict their performance relative to others before they did it. Yeah, um, yeah we use large samples because it's really hard to answer these questions without that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, what were some of the things that you expected to have an effect that didn't? Well, you know, it's tough because a lot of the things are, are somewhat ambiguous. Like, for example, 
one of the things we expected to have an effect is like how much it relates to your ego. Mm. We thought like if you would feel bad about not being good at it, maybe that will affect it. And we just didn't find a very strong effect there. Huh. But then again, well, we did find that if it relates to your personality or character. Mm. So that's kind of like being related to your ego, but not quite the same thing. Yeah. We, were you running a regression where you did all of these things at once? And so maybe one of them was cannibalizing the effect of the other. Exactly. It may be just that, that once you took into account personality or character, it kind of sapped the, the power out of ego or something like that. Mm. Um, but these were the five we, we were looking, looking for here is stability. Hmm. We wanted to find the ones that like through the different studies we ran, we got a consistent effect in the same direction. So it didn't hinge on the kind of the details of the way we did the study. Hmm. And that's how we came to these five. So we definitely wouldn't claim these are the only five. You could also carve up the space of traits differently, right? There's, you know, for any given trait, you might be able to find other traits that are correlated with it. You could have used instead, hmm. but these five were, were kind of robust ones that we were able to uncover. Yeah. So what are the broader lessons we can take away from this? I suppose one is uh, people are, people are always told that everyone's overconfident all the time. Well, that, that's a simple story. Uh, but it's, but it's much more complex than that. Yeah. That, that is not, although I would say it is a general rule. It's often true. Um, there are domains that people tend to be un, over, underconfident in. Mm-hmm. And th- these kind of five traits can actually help you pick out what those domains might be. And we're exploring now building a little tool that will mm-hmm. help you can put down a skill and we want to help you be able to actually make a prediction about whether people will be under or overconfident. So hopefully that will come out on clearthinking.org in, in a few months. I guess there is this other um, concept of overconfidence, which uh, I think is more technically called overprecision, which is uh, if you ask someone to say, uh, you know, what's the population of China? Uh, give me a range that it's 90 percent likely to fall into that range. They tend to give too narrow a range. Um, have you studied that at all? Or do you know what the results are there? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So people people tend to give um, narrow ranges on these things. And so that's another form of overconfidence. It's actually very confusing in the literature because people use these words interchangeably, but they're actually different. Um, there's a third type of overconfidence, which is like your absolute performance, mm. not your relative performance for other people. Um, when it comes to this kind of uh, making a prediction interval of like the likelihood, you know, of the number of people in China being between a certain number and a certain number mm. there, that gets into the idea of calibration training, mm. which is that you can actually learn to make those interval estimates more accurate. Mm. And we've actually done a bunch of work on this. We're working on building, a, we're working on a project that will help train people on calibration. Mm. And actually, we, we made a tool before, which you actually find on clearthing.org, where we give you 30 things where half of them are common misconceptions and half of them are things that sound like common misconceptions, but they're actually true. And for each of them, you have to say whether it's true or false, and then you have to make a prediction of how confident you are. And then we, at the end, we analyze it and give you an indication of whether you tend to be over or underconfident and kind of teach you about your, your predictive capabilities. Yeah, I did that one last year. It's, uh, it's a really fun to try to pick out which are the, which are the misconceptions and which, um, which are not, which are the fake ones that you guys have planted in there. Not you know, to brag, I was pretty well calibrated. <laughs> <laughs> Nicely done. Well, you know, a funny thing about that. So it was surprisingly hard to figure out what was true with the, mm. with regard to these common misconceptions. Oh. And we actually made a few mistakes, which we only learned over more than a year of people using the tool. <laughs> We'd occasionally have someone who's like an expert in some really tiny domain yeah. be like, actually, I'm an Egyptologist and I know that this is not true. And huh. so it took us like probably a year to get all the bugs out of it. I think, fingers crossed, they're all correct now. Yeah. But to me, that was really a lesson in how difficult it can be to figure out the truth about things. Mm. And we would cite things from sources we thought were super reputable. Mm. And it turned out they were citing someone who was citing someone who was citing someone. <laughs> and, you know, you go through that whole chain of citations and it bottoms out nowhere, you know? <laughs> yeah, I guess, well, maybe if you'd had the right answers at the time, my calibration would have been much worse. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it, yeah, there is this phenomenon where you get kind of myths and then you get like myths about the myths. So you get like a fake, like a mythical uh, refutation of it. Uh, oh, interesting. I, I, yeah, there's a thing about spinach, I think, uh, like the amount of iron in spinach. So the original myth, I think, is that there's lots of iron in spinach. And then there was this like mythical refutation about how it was a, a decimal point error. Uh, but in, uh, so it's like, oh, no, it's a myth that uh, spinach has lots of iron. But it was ac- so and, and that, that the original one is false, but for a totally different reason. The, the decimal oh point gosh. thing is just also, also itself like an urban legend. Oh, my gosh. It's, <laughs> it's terrible. Truth is, is really complicated to figure out. Mm. And, you know, these are around things that people don't generally like. Mm. Um, don't have a really strong burning opinion about, right? Yeah. I mean, think about how bad it is when people have a bias where they really yeah. want a certain answer to be right. Mm. You know, it, it's hard to figure out the truth even when, you know, people can be pretty dispassionate. So, Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll see if I can find the, the true story about iron and spinach. It, I mean, it does make you despair. If we can't even figure that one out, then uh, <laughs> what but, is there for anything else? But, you know, on the plus side, putting it out there in the world mm. and having people comment on it, I think, you know, it eventually debugs things and you know if you're willing to listen to people's opinions you can make it kind of incrementally more accurate so 
Yeah, it's interesting. I guess the internet has made it a lot easier to spread myths, but also made it a lot easier probably to to correct them. Uh, or you can like find the person in the world who knows the most about this issue in Egypt. Uh, and yeah, they, exactly. they can set you straight. Whereas otherwise you just never have a hope of connecting with them. Exactly. All right. So I guess uh, this raises the general issue of uh, how you can decide uh, what's evidence for a claim and what's not and how much you should change your belief based on, on what you observe. You've, you've uh, spent a lot of time, I guess, thinking about this question of, of how to update accurately. Uh, do you want to give an, an intro to this topic? Absolutely. Yeah. So this ties into the idea of Bayesianism, which is sort of the math, the probabilistic mathematical theory of how to how much to change your beliefs based on evidence. And the way I like to think about this is actually using an English la- language phrase that, that we like to call the question of evidence. And we actually have a module on clearthinking.org that teaches you how to use the question of evidence to evaluate the strength of evidence. Um, so if you're interested, go check that out. But the way the question of evidence works is it asks the English language question, how likely would I be to see this evidence if my hypothesis is true compared to if it's false? So let's say if that was if you got a three to one ratio, like you're three times more likely to see this evidence if my hypothesis is true than if it's false, you know, that, that gives you a moderate amount of evidence. If it's 30 to one, you're 30 times more likely to see this evidence if your hypothesis is true than if it's false. That's really strong evidence. If it's just one, you know, you're, you're as likely to see this evidence if, the, if your hypothesis is true than if it's false. That's no evidence. It actually doesn't push you in any way. And then if it's one in three, you know, one third, then that pushes you evidence in the opposite direction. It's mm. moderate evidence in the opposite direction. One in 30 would be strong evidence in the opposite direction. Mm. So I think what a lot of people don't realize is like these, all these equations and so on can be very confusing, but there's that English language sentence, which is the only way to say how strong evidence is. Like that is the right sentence. Other sentences that sound similar actually are not the right way to quantify evidence. Yeah. What other expressions do we use that you don't like? Well, informally, people often think like, oh, if this thing uh, seems likely to occur, if my hypothesis mm. is true, then that's strong evidence. Well, mm. not necessarily, because you again, you have to say... It's the how, ratio. It's the ratio. How likely is this evidence to occur if my hypothesis is true compared to if it's not true? And so they might leave out the compared to if it's not true. You know, so, so there's a lot of ways that our brains can kind of get like, not quite use the right formulation of this. Mm. And you have to kind of go back to that sentence and say, huh, okay, but let me go back to the sentence. And kind of estimate that. And, you know, you're generally not going to get a hard number. It's not like you're going to say the number is actually 3.2, but you often will have a, a gut feeling that, oh, yeah, this evidence is actually quite a lot more likely if my love is true than if it's not. Yeah. So uh, what's that called? So that's called the, the Bayes factor. Hmm. So the Bayes factor is the likelihood of seeing this evidence if the hypothesis is true compared to or divided by the likelihood of seeing this evidence if the hypothesis is not true. Hmm. And that, that quantifies the amount of evidence. But then the question is, what do you do with the Bayes factor, right? Hmm. Well, it tells you how much evidence you have for or against something, for or against a hypothesis. Then you have to think about, well, what did I believe before that? Hmm. And that's called your prior. So you, you kind of have this prior belief about how much more likely your hypothesis is than not your hypothesis. Hmm. And then you use the base factor to update that belief to get your new probability of how likely the hypothesis is relative to not the hypothesis. Okay. So you've got your original probability of the claim being true. And then you multiply it by the probability of seeing the data if uh, it is true over the probability of seeing that data if it was false. Close. Yeah. Okay, so uh, it seems a little funny to work in terms of odds, but it mm. turns out that the math works much more nicely in terms mm. of odds. That's why we use, uh, that's why we, we do always do it relative. Like the probability of seeing this evidence of the hypothesis is true mm. relative to the, the probability of the evidence of the hypothesis is not true. Um, that's kind of an odds ratio of how much more likely something is than something else. Mm. You then have to, your, your prior is how much more likely is your hypothesis to be true hmm. versus not true before you looked at the evidence. Yeah. So if you thought there was like, it was three times more likely that your hypothesis is true hmm. than that it wasn't true before you saw the evidence. So it was a three to one odds. Now you get some evidence and you think that it's, you know, 10 times more likely to see this evidence if your hypothesis is true than not true. Hmm. Then you're going to take 10 times three. Now, it's 30 to 1. 30 to 1 odds, mm. right. So you're, you start with certain odds and you're adjusting your odds as you get evidence. Mm. And then you can convert that back to a probability if you like. You can convert it back to probability if you like, or you can just work with odds if you get comfortable doing that. Yeah. Do, do you prefer using odds or, or percentages? It's much nicer using odds when you're doing Bayesian updating, mm. like when you're trying to figure out the strength of evidence, because the formula works out really nicely. It's simple multiplication. Yeah. Okay. Do you want to go through uh, a simple example, I guess, other than the diagnostic test for breast cancer or something like that? Yeah. The classical. Uh, is there a particular topic you want to do around? Mm, I'm trying to think. 
elections or soccer matches i suppose okay so like the world cup's on right now i'm tracking that a lot no, no, you, you start out, <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe maybe i could walk you through it so you start out with uh, with two teams maybe that are similarly matched and perhaps you originally think there's a one in three chance that uh, your your favorite team uh will win say i guess uh, I'm, I'm backing spain or something like that okay so the odds of winning there would then be one to two and then say in the first minute for simplicity they they score a goal um how how might we update there i guess then we need to look at uh, I mean, I guess, I guess it gets complicated pretty fast, right? Um, right. So, so then, then the question you want to ask yourself is how much more likely would I be to see this evidence that they scored a goal mm. if they are going to win compared to if they aren't going to win? Yeah. Uh, and you have to, and there you're going to, it's going to be a subjective assessment based on your intuition about, about soccer, right? Mm. You know, someone scoring a goal early in the game is that, you know, much, much more likely to occur if the team ends up winning relative if they don't, or only a little bit more likely to occur or whatever. Mm. You probably have more soccer intuition than I do. <laughs> uh, and so this is where you, this, and this is where kind of your experience is going to come in. Hmm. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Is it just subjective judgment at that point? I suppose you could have a more explicit model of, uh, of you could, kind of look, you could look absolutely. at a lot of games. And- yeah. If you had a data set of all the games that were played and you, let's say they got a goal in the first 10 minutes, hmm. you could look at the data of, of all the times that, you know, one team gets a goal in the first 10 minutes before the other team has scored. What percentage of the time did they beat that team? Hmm. That could actually give you this evidence and you could actually do a calculation around it. But if you're just hanging out with your friends and you're yeah. trying to see, you know, how, how, you know, what's the chance your team's going to win that you prefer, you're going to kind of do a more subjective judgment of like, how, how strong is that evidence? Okay. So let's say a uh, team scores in the first minutes. Uh, I'm going to say that I'd be, uh, three times as likely to see that, um, if they are going to win as if they're not. Right. That, that's the right phrasing. Yep. So it'll be a likelihood ratio then of three to one. Yeah. Times by one to two. So right. Because the prior with- odds, the prior odds were one to two that they would win because out of the three possibilities, only one of them involves them winning, right? Hmm. It was one to two. Exactly. And then you multiply that by your, the base factor, which is the, the new evidence. Hmm. So then I've got three over two. So I've got a, we've gone from a 30% chance of winning or 33% chance of winning to a 60% chance of winning based on that goal. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, I mean, I've been aware of, uh, Bayes rule for ages, but, uh, cause I've always been thinking in terms of probabilities. I've often found it very hard to apply or I've, I've been able to do it reasonably when the odds are close to 50, 50, cause then, um, you don't run up against this like, kind of upper bound or lower bound of zero or a hundred percent. Um, but yeah, with the odds, I, I, I can do it like uh, when it's at the extremes as well. Yeah. The odds way of thinking about it actually, tur- although it's like a little annoying to convert between odds and probabilities and you mm-hmm. kind of have to wrap your mind around that. Um, it turns out to just be much simpler to think about. So I always like to think about an odds, but I'll tell you the way that I use this the most in life is I get, you know, I, I have some belief about a thing. I get some evidence and I, and I want to know, wait a minute, is this like a really str- let's say it's evidence against my, what my belief. Hmm. And I want to say to myself, is this weak evidence or is this strong evidence or is this kind of moderate? Hmm. And I like to do that double check of, well, how likely it would be to get this evidence if my hypothesis was true relative to if it's not hmm. get a kind of intuitive feeling. Is it, you know, is it 30 to one? Is it three to one? Is it more like one to one? And then that sort of tells me intuitively, should I like downgrade my belief in the theory or not? Um, how much I should downgrade it. So it's not so much as I'm doing an explicit calculation, but you know, it's really interesting to see that surprisingly often your brain won't necessarily automatically do the right thing. Your brain won't necessarily automatically realize that, oh, this is strong evidence or this is only very weak evidence. Okay. So, uh, what are some takeaways from this? So this way of thinking, this Bayesian way of thinking is the kind of the formal mathematically correct way of thinking about how to adjust probabilities when you get evidence. Mm-hmm. And so it's interesting to say, well, what does it tell us about how evidence works? One thing it tells us is that evidence is always probabilistic, right? Mm. We start with some probabilistic belief about the world, like a hypothesis with some amount of probability we assign to it, and then we have to adjust that probability. So, and I think this lesson, while very basic, is like one of the most important lessons that Mm. every one of your beliefs could turn out to be false. Now, maybe some of them you're 99.99% confident, but that's not the same as being 100% confident. Mm. And in fact, one of the things that Bayesianism tells us, this idea of multiplying by the base factor, is that you can never get to 100%. Hmm. So if you start with like a three to one odds and you start accumulating evidence, you're going to keep multiplying by different numbers, but it's never going to go to infinity. You're never going to get an odd of infinity to one. Hmm. In other words, and that's equivalent to saying you're never going to get to 100% belief. So if you, unless you started with 100% belief somehow when you were born, hmm. if you're a Bayesian updater, you're never going to end up with 100% belief. And so I think this is, a, this is also an important lesson. Another lesson I think we can take away from this, it's very important, is that if you ignore small amounts of evidence, it can really lead you in the wrong direction. So say you're like 
very confident, you're 95% confident something's true. And then you get a trickle of evidence that's like a slightly against it mm. that says it's not true. And then you get another trickle of evidence, another trickle of evidence, all saying it's not true. Mm. But none of them are that strong. Mm. Well, if you don't update each time, then you could just say, oh, well, I'm 95% confident. So I'm almost sure this thing's true. And this evidence is very weak, so I'm just going to throw it away. Mm. And then the next evidence comes in. You're like, oh, this is very weak. And you throw it away. But if you throw it away enough times, actually it could turn out you should now believe the opposite. Mm. But you've never, because you kept dismissing the evidence, because no, no single packet of evidence was so strong to change your mind, well, now you end up with the wrong belief. Mm. And so one thing we learned from this is that really like the way evidence should work is that we're kind of, it, kind of, it's smooth. It's like gradually adjusting all the time. We're getting a little more confident when we get evidence in favor, we're getting a little bit less confident when we get evidence against. Interesting. So, so you mentioned earlier that, um, often when people uh, present evidence against your view, you don't automatically kind of uh, figure out what is the right Bayes factor. Um, are there any kind of systematic errors that you think you're making there? Or is it just that you you don't really intuitively or like humans don't instinctively think in terms of, you know, what is the likelihood of seeing this evidence if it's true versus if it's false? Yeah. So um, one error, like we talked about, is they, they might say, oh, this evidence is likely on, if my hypothesis is true, but they don't realize it's also might be likely if mm. the hypothesis is, is not true. Um, another thing is that sometimes people will get fairly weak evidence and they, and they kind of interpret it as much stronger evidence than it really is. Mm. Um, so they're kind of looking at like how compatible that evidence is or something, but they're not actually evaluating the formal strength of the evidence, which is what the base factor tells you. And so it can, it can be very confusing. Another error people make is they don't take into account the prior probability. Mm. So they're kind of just evaluating the evidence as though they didn't know anything previously. Mm. Um, you know, example of this that I see my own brain do a lot is like, mm. let's say I'm walking and I'm traveling and I'm walking in a foreign city and I see someone that vaguely looks like a friend of mine. My brain will immediately be like, oh, that's so and so. But then I, ha I do this mental correction being like, OK, but the prior probability of so and so being in this random city that I'm in right now is so low, even if it looks quite a bit like the person, mm. it's probably not them. Unless it like really looks exactly like them, and then okay, it probably actually is them. Yeah. Whereas if, uh, if you saw that uh, the same thing in in the city that you both live, then you'd be it's much more likely to think it was them. Exactly, much more likely because it was much more likely uh, to begin with. Okay, so this uh, raises a whole uh, bunch of issues that um, hopefully we'll be able to get to over the over the next uh, forty or fifty minutes. So we, we've we've discussed here kind of priors, so kind of what's your pre-existing belief, and and then how to how to update. But uh, we could we could discuss kind of how often should you um, stick to common sense. So when should you really believe your prior or put a lot of weight on it versus updating based on the things that you see? There's you know where does this prior come from? So what class of things should you be considering and including when you're trying to assess? I guess the base rate of of the thing that you're evaluating actually occurring. Then there's how much weight to give to uh, explicit models and theories that people present to you. So if they ha yeah, have some kind of microeconomic model of uh, how something works, uh, under what circumstances should you update a lot versus a little? Then there's uh, your direct empirical evidence. So if, if you get a new study on nutrition that says that some particular food is uh, especially healthy or unhealthy, uh, how much do you update uh, on that? Then there's other kind of evidence like uh, heuristics that people use, which is a lot of uh, rules of thumb that uh, seem to guide people well in general, uh, even if you even if they're not like explicitly quantitative in form. And then often at the end, uh, I think when we're doing, uh, when we're, we're evaluating a lot of evidence together, or if there's been a particularly strong argument that's tried to move our belief uh, a lot in one direction, I, I imagine both of us kind of do error checks. So we think, well, if this was true, what would that imply? And is, is, uh, is it showing something that else that we don't observe that, uh, that contradicts then or that suggests that we've made a mistake? Mm -hmm. Um, so maybe, maybe we can take some of these things in turn. Sounds great. All right. So. Something that I have a big interest in is uh, when should we trust common sense and follow, uh, you know, give a lot of weight to our priors and, and, and when should we not? Uh, do you have much of a view on this? Well, I think it's important to note that we all intuitively form beliefs all the time based on just the things we see around us. Hmm. And, you know, that, make, that makes a lot of sense, right? We have a direct perception of the world and that gives us a ton of evidence. Hmm. Where it gets a little sketchier is when there's things that we're not directly witnessing yeah. over and over and over again. So it's either something that we witness rarely and we try to make some inference from it, or when it's something we don't witness at all and we just hear it through someone else. It's, it's filtered through other people. Hmm. And those are the times when, uh, when our, you know, kind of like intuitive beliefs start getting a little, a little hairier and we might begin to begin to doubt them. When it comes to common sense, uh, there are certain kinds of things you would expect common sense to be effective at. Like maybe people's common sense about how to stay safe might, might, you know, you might expect that humans are like pretty good at that sort of thing. But people's common sense about really difficult philosophical problems mm. or difficult problems in computer science or something like that, mm. if they're not like someone who's trained specifically in that thing, you know, I don't know why you would expect common sense to be particularly good at those kinds of problems. 
Yeah. I think that that's how I think about it is looking at different fields and thinking uh, like, do humans get feedback on whether they're right about these questions? Uh, like feedback personally and also feedback uh, potentially through evolution that, you know, humans who kind of got these things wrong in the past tended to die more frequently or, you know, or at least find out about it and correct it culturally. That's a, that's a really excellent point, the, the feedback issue. And it's actually really interesting to think about, like, when can a human learn to do something? Mm. When, and and this another way to rephrase this is when can we trust our intuition, right? Mm. And if we're in a situation where we do something over and over again, like there's some variability in the domain, but not too much. We get feedback on how we did, but it, the feedback's not too noisy hmm. and we get a lot of repetition. Hmm. We can learn to predict all sorts of things accurately, hmm. right? Like, so for, for example, imagine you're a, a psychologist, you see patients every day. Hmm. One thing you get feedback on is whether the patient gets upset in your office. So you could imagine a therapist actually getting really good at like preempting, oh, this patient seems like they're about to get really upset. Hmm. Maybe getting really good at like predicting what they can do to help the patient calm down because they have very rapid feedback on that. But they might have much less rapid feedback on whether the person's doing well a year late or something like mm. that. So that's a, t- a much less tight feedback loop. It might be harder to build their intuition. And there they might have to rely more on studies or theories rather than just like what their gut tells them about what's going to make this patient better in a year. Yeah. Okay. So uh, how about I... Um I'll rattle off uh, different kinds of questions and then uh, you can tell me whether you think uh, you should give a lot of weight to your prior uh, or not. Okay, so uh, you're talking to someone and you're trying to evaluate uh, how they feel about you or, or what they're, um, whether they're happy or not. Yeah, I think here people actually differ a lot in their ability to make this kind of prediction. So the, really you have to have some self-awareness and say, am I the sort of person that's good at reading social information or maybe I'm not so good at it. There are some people that are incredible at this mm. where they can really read, you know, things on people's faces and people be like, what, how did you know that I'm feeling that way? Mm. Um, you know, subtle emotions. Other people are just really not good at it and they can't read even like emotions that would often be obvious to others. Mm. And so there, you know, a lot of variability individually. Yeah. I guess uh, it's true that there's a huge amount of variability here, which is kind of interesting because you'd think you know, evolution would push us pretty strongly to, to being good at this because uh, people who uh, you know big, made big social mistakes or couldn't read other people uh, would have been at a big a big disadvantage in uh, social situations in the ancestral environment. You'd think so. It could be that, that um, some ways of being low social skill could be associated mm. with other positive benefits. Mm. It's a possibility, yeah. um, but it's tough to say for sure. It's also just a super difficult problem. Uh, which which could explain yeah why people make mistakes because uh, I guess the people who are very good at this are reading tiny cues. Uh, but, you know, computers can't can't do this uh, at this point, even though they're like able to see things and replay them and analyze them in great detail. Although increasingly, machine learning algorithms are beginning to be able to read face facial emotions. And so, for example, I saw this machine learning system where they'd have people watch advertisements, and the machine learning would try to actually measure their emotion throughout the ad and see, oh, people are getting excited and now they're, mm. you know, now they're feeling surprised or whatever, that kind of thing. Yeah, I expect they're going to be beating us pretty soon. All right. Uh, philosophy. So I think philosophy is some of the hardest stuff out there. Mm. Uh, and our intuitions are, are just not well honed. Um, often philosophers use their use intuition in their arguments. This is sort of an interesting debate. Mm. You know, a lot of philosophers will acknowledge this. They'll say, yes, intuition is part of our argumentation technique. Mm. Other philosophers, I think a minority of them, deny this and say, actually, they don't, they don't use um, intuition. And then there's an interesting debate of like, is a philosopher's intuition about philosophical problems actually like well honed? You know, I think, I think that you can go back and forth in this. And one reason potentially though to doubt whether like you can have a well honed intuition uh, on these kind of things is it's not clear we ever find out the right answer, right? <laughs> like maybe we find out, sometimes we find out this thing's the wrong answer because we find it's inconsistent or there's a problem, but mm. rarely do we like, oh yeah, we solved that part of philosophy. Now we know that we were right on that. Mm. Um, that being said, some of philosophy is really about trying to figure out things like your own values or or what, what things mean to you. And there you really are reflecting on your own internal systems. Mm. And if you're doing that, if you're trying to, like, you know, like our discussion of intrinsic values, if, if, if you consider that part of philosophy, like figuring out your intrinsic values, mm. well, you have no choice but to use your intuition because your mm. intuition is, is like the system that tells you what you value. So, you mm. know, you're out of luck figuring out another way. Yeah. Okay. Uh, cooking. So as someone who's a terrible cook, uh, I don't trust my intuition in cooking at all. Mm. Um, but when you cook a lot, you certainly develop an intuition. No question. I mean, you watch people who are really good chefs. They don't, re- you know, they're not reading the recipe. They're just like, oh, I think it needs a little more of this, a little more of that. And they're probably right because they've cooked so many recipes and tasted them throughout the process of cooking them that they really, their, their, their gut system is very, very good. Okay. Um, macroeconomics. Ooh, so macroeconomics is really tricky because I think a lot of it is actually very counterintuitive. Mm. 
you know, where, where people will kind of expect a certain thing to happen. And that it, it, because of weird second order effects or because of the way incentives work or, um, or just subtle things about supply and demand, it won't work the way you expect. So I think actually a lot of times our intuitions are just like not useful in that domain. Yeah. I think, I think they're actually worse than random in that case, which is interesting. They might be. There seems to be all these surprising ways and like where the, the first order effect is in a certain way. And so we just, have a really hard time believing that that's not the way that the, the final effect goes. You know what I mean? Yeah. Or you mean like on a small scale, it's one way. And then on a big scale, it's actually almost the reverse. Exactly. It's like, well, if, you know, if you pay one person more money, clearly that's good for them. So why don't, you know, we force all companies to pay people more money. And then you're like, wait, yeah, just... but if every company was forced to pay everyone more money, like there's sort of. Was that just raise the prices of everything and then it cancels out? Yeah. So you get this really good kind of counterintuitive effects when you start like trying to take your like local intuition about everyday life and globalize it to a whole economy. Yeah. I think uh, it's often called the fallacy of aggregation. All right. Uh, what's, what's a different domain? Um, like human social psychology, the kind of thing that, that you're studying. So human social psychology, that's a really interesting one because I think for a lot of us, we actually have pretty good intuition about a bunch of things about psychology. Certainly not all things, but a bunch of things. Like most people could tell you, if you describe a story, they could tell you like, will someone be sad if that happened to them or angry or, you know, and people will be pretty good at that. And there's many social things about the way people relate to each other where we're pretty good predictors. Hmm. So that actually raises the bar pretty high because if you're a psychologist trying to discover some new thing about psychology, yeah. you're competing against people's pretty well-honed intuitive psychology detectors hmm. uh, that, that they have really, you know, not only are they pretty well honed, but they're getting feedback all the time on like, oh, they mispredicted my friend and now my friend's angry at me and that kind of thing. That being said, there certainly are some findings in psychology that people would not have predicted that like, you you know, you wouldn't just expect them to be true automatically. Yeah, I guess uh, since, since like pretty, pretty often those things, uh, oh, they're, they're not replicating super well. So I wonder whether in fact our intuition was better when we, because uh, so a lot of these social psychology results have got a lot of attention. They got a lot of attention because they were surprising. They were against our intuitions that like small, just like subtle things about the environment can change our behavior a lot. Uh, and in as much as they're not, not, not being replicated, maybe actually we just had a good sense that actually, no, those things don't matter so much to begin with. It, it, yeah, it's certainly true that um, a bunch of findings haven't replicated that mm. people, and a lot of people were really surprised by. Yeah. Um, there's one I want to talk to you about in particular, which sure. is that of power posing. Okay, yeah, yeah. So as, as many of you may know, um, there was a really famous TED Talk. I think it was one of the most viewed TED Talks of all time mm. about this idea of power posing, that adopting certain postures can make you feel more powerful. And, you know, so imagine, you know, the posture that Superman might adopt or, mm. you know, that kind of thing. Um, and what happened is, there were a bunch of critiques of that research that came out. Um, and, and then people tried to actually replicate the study. As far as I know, I think there were six pre-registered replications where the people trying to replicate it like in advance said, here's the method we're going to do. Mm. You know, here's, here's the process. Then they went and did it mm. and they tried to replicate it. And, um, I believe if I recall correctly that by the standard way of deciding whether, you know, P less than 0.05 statistical significance, I think four of them did not replicate mm. the, even the effects of people feeling more powerful. Mm. And I think two of them did replicate the effects of people feeling more powerful. Mm. But in the original study, they claim not that just that it makes you feel more powerful. They'd also claim that it changes your cortisol levels. Mm. It changes your risk taking behavior and so on. And those, as far as I know, those effects really did not replicate. And so there's this really interesting thing that's happened where all these people now have come and attacked the original research saying there were flaws in the original research. This stuff doesn't replicate. Mm. Power posing is fake. Stop doing it before you go on stage or before a meeting. Mm. But the irony to me is like, I actually think that power posing works. Oh, wow. Okay. And I'll tell you why I think that. Yeah, hit me. Um, well, so first of all, I happen to be a person that I think is very effective by my body posture. Mm. And so when I change postures, I actually can notice like a a fairly palpable effect if it's a large change of posture. So it was very strange to me when the, when the power posing stuff didn't replicate that I'm like, wait, but I can just literally do an experiment on myself where like I change one posture, I change to another, I feel an effect, I change to another. So, you know, as someone who like directly perceives that effect, I find it very strange. That being said, you know, as, as attempting to be a good skeptic, I don't necessarily, maybe I'm deluding myself, maybe I'm confused. So I went and ran a study um, that is the size of all of the pre-registered trials put together <laughs> n equals a thousand. I pre-registered it as well. Mm. And I tried to see whether you could, whether, um, people have a mood effect. Does, does power posing increase your mood? Mm. Um, and so still working on analyzing all the results, but the top line result is that yes, we found a mood effect 
Doing the power poses seems to increase people's mood. It seems to also increase their feelings of power. There's a, a data scientist uh, that I'm friends with who actually said he would go reanalyze our results, see if he agrees with us. So he's checking them, see if he thinks we did the analysis properly. But the, the combination of this data plus my firsthand experience j- just alternating between different power, uh, different poses really suggests to me that actually power posing might work. And maybe the critiques were accurate in the sense that they were accurately finding flaws in the original research, mm. but maybe they actually misled people into thinking that this, this method doesn't actually work. Uh, so, yeah, why do you think those replications mostly didn't find these effects that, that you're finding? Well, you're here's measuring a, something different. Here's a really interesting thing. So there were, as far as I know, there were six pre-registered replications. Two of them found an effect at P less than 0.05, Four of them didn't. Hmm. Now, is that the pattern you'd expect if power posing didn't work? Maybe it has like small effects. Is that the answer? Exactly. That's what I think is going on. I think that what's happening is power posing has small effects. It's, it's subtle. It's not, you know, it's not like profound to change your life. It's a subtle effect. And so I think what's happening is that this pattern of replicate, didn't replicate, replicate, didn't replicate, didn't replicate, you know, that, that to me, that suggests a sort of a relatively small effect you know, those studies weren't big enough to reliably detect it. Mm. And actually someone went out and did a Bayesian meta-analysis trying to combine all the evidence from the six studies and they concluded that it does, it does actually have the effect. Mm. Um, so I'm, uh, so I'm not the only one that, that thinks that. Now here's another thing about this. I suspect that people vary a lot on this dimension of how much body posture affects their mood. Mm. And so basically what I, what I suspect is that for some people like actually has no effect on them. Other people, it's kind of like a really small effect. And then some people, it's actually like quite a large effect. And I think I'm in the kind of large, tend to be larger effect group. Uh, and so maybe that's also partly why this is confusing, because some people are like utterly convinced by their own experience that this is totally useless. And other people are like, wait, what are you talking about? I can do this. And I like actually feel a mood boost. So it seems significant to me. Yeah, I was going to say my prior on this being true was pretty low. And then I think even when that study came out, because of all of the issues with publication bias, it wouldn't have like updated me very much in favor of it. So maybe we think there's a 5% chance that this is true. Now, this has just been unfair. I start with like a 10% chance, and the study comes out, and then I inch up to 15% or something like that. So what's your update on on the six pre-registrations, two of which seem to find a statistically significant effect, and then my N equals 1,000 uh, study that, that found an effect? Uh, I, Applied Bayesian updating. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I would have moved upwards on it having um, some effect, like a non-zero effect. But Got maybe it. it's like a shrunk on it having a very large effect. We're kind of narrowing it down to yeah, like yeah. something that's a bit above zero, but not a lot. Yeah, yeah. I, and I think that's a very reasonable way to look at it. Mm. Now, if I'm taking the devil's advocate perspective, mm. you could say, well, but maybe it's a placebo effect. Mm. And there, it's actually really interesting. It's almost philosophical. Like, what exactly do we mean by placebo effect? The whole thing we were going for kind of is a placebo effect, right? Yeah, in a certain sense, like, what we care, if we care about making people feel more powerful, you know, the placebo is actually one mechanism by which you could do that. It wouldn't imply that it's useless. It would just imply that there's, the mechanism is believing that you're going to feel more powerful makes you feel more powerful. Mm. What would be really bad is if it was actually a reporting bias effect. In other words, people actually don't feel more powerful, but for some reason they report feeling more powerful Mm. when they're in that posture, because then you wouldn't actually be producing the effect at all. Mm. And if I'm playing devil's advocate against our own research, when we looked at people who, at the end of the study, we asked people, do you believe that body posture can affect mood? Mm. And for people that said no, they got a much weaker effect than the people who said that yes. But, but maybe they, they just know themselves. Exactly. Maybe, maybe this really is a trait that there's a high degree of variability and people whose body posture does affect mood have at some point in their life realized that. Mm. And so they're like, yeah, it affects mood. And then they also does actually affect their mood. Mm. So, you know, it's interesting to get in the weeds of this. We're continuing the analysis, mm. but I'm looking forward to kind of getting this, this research out there. Okay, so uh, a way that you can try to be more uh, robust in coming up with your prior, or, or I guess like in a sense updating your prior, um, other than just applying common sense, is uh, kind of reference class forecasting. So looking at similar cases and then seeing uh, how how often uh, something is true on average. Do you want to describe the instances of that? Yeah, absolutely. So suppose you're trying to decide, like, is my friend who I invited to dinner going to flake out on me? Mm. And you you could imagine, actually, if you were if you were really bored, writing down the twi- last 20 times you saw your friend mm. and which ones of, the, the, uh, of those times they flaked. And then you could use that and say, okay, well, three out of the 20 times they flaked. And, you know, you can calculate kind of a probability of flaking from that. Mm. And the thing that's cool about that, is, despite it being kind of laborious and boring, is that it, it, you know, there's some evidence it produces better estimates than our kind of intuitive judgment of like, would this person flake? Mm. And part of the problem with our intuitive judgment is it can be affected by a lot of things that are not that relevant, mm. like recency. Now, 
Well, it is true that the most recent time you saw your friend is probably the most relevant. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily way more relevant than three times ago, yet the most recent time might stick in memory a lot more, and you might kind of overweight it intuitively relative to three times ago Mm -hmm. in terms of how likely this person is to flake. Also, just reference classical forecasting in general, it's a nice way to kind of get that initial prior. Mm -hmm. So so maybe you say, okay, three out of 20, that's my like prior probability, But I have reason to think that my friend is less likely to fake this time for such and such reasons. So now I'm going to adjust that and they're going to, you know, you know, going to reduce down the chance of them flaking. So you kind of start with this prior and you're kind of update on the other things, you know, these kind of other pieces of evidence you haven't yet used in producing your prior. Yeah. So, so the standard story, I guess uh, people can read in Kahneman's uh, Thinking Fast and Slow, is that since the reference class is kind of an outside view, so you're taking like a broader picture that's a bit less personal uh, of the situation. And then you've got the inside view, which is like the, the kind of your personal perspective on it um, or like you know, your view on this specific instance. So here, like the outside view would just be, like, I guess the most outside view would be how often do people show up to dinner in general, uh, just, just across everyone yep. in the population. Then you can narrow it down to kind of people you know, uh, how, often, yeah, how, do, how often do all your friends in general show up? Then you've got your specific friend is getting like more narrow than the, than the most outside view. And then uh, you could say, what about my friend in the last year is like getting more, it's, it's a reference class yep. that's even more, more constrained. We think of this in mathematics as like a bias versus variance trade-off. Hmm. Um, you, as you zoom in on more and more relevant like subset of the data, like, oh, this particular friend and just in the last year, yeah. what happens is it gets less biased because it's really about the thing you care about, hmm. but it gets, there's higher variation because you have less data, hmm. right? Maybe you only saw the friend six times in the last year and you only have six data points. That's not very many data points. You could broaden that to the last two years and now maybe you have 14 data points, but maybe your friend has kind of changed their personal habits. Hmm. And so the further you go back, you get more data. So you have less variation, but you have more bias in the data set. And so actually, ideally, if you were kind of a perfectly rational agent, you'd be trying to find the point at which, op- like, you know, uh, optimize the trade off between bias and variance. Yeah. Okay. So I've heard this called the reference class problem. Like, well, what reference, cl- reference classes should you look at and how should you weight them? Um, do you have any advice on, on how you should weight them? Well, I think that, I mean, that is kind of, I think, the way to think about it is this, like, how much bias am I getting versus how much variability? Mm. Um, if you have a very small data set, you're probably willing to add some bias to get more. If you only have five data points, maybe you want to add bias if it's going to get you up to 30 data points, because that's going to be a lot better. If you already have 300 data points, you probably don't want to add more bias because it's probably already plenty of data points mm. and adding more bias is just going to make your solution worse. So that's kind of the, that, that's if you really only want to pick one reference class. Mm. Another approach is that you could say, let's, let's produce multiple reference classes mm. and then we're going to kind of weight them by how relevant they are. Mm. So an example of this is let's say you're, you're making, uh, you're running two advertisements for a product and you want to know, did advertisement A work better than advertisement B? Well, one way to look at that is uh, how many clicks on each ad occurred. That is good because you have a lot of data, but it's bad because someone clicking doesn't mean they're going to go buy your product. Hmm. You could also look at how many people actually bought the product. Well, that's good because it's exactly, it's what you care about, but it's bad because you only have a tiny fraction of the amount of data. So you might, one way to think about this in that case would be to take the, the, let's say you, you were able to calculate on average, every 50 clicks lead to one purchase. So one way to think about that, just heuristically or intuitively, is you could say, if an ad got a purchase, we count that as being worth 50 clicks, right? So we could take the number of clicks plus the number of like pseudo clicks, so 50 times the number of purchases, and that's like a score for ad one, and then we could do the same for ad two. And so that's a way of like combining different reference classes, essentially, that and weighing their different strengths and weaknesses. Yeah. So just coming back to the flaking example, let's say that you'd met your friends twenty, your friend for dinner 20 times ever, and they'd shown up every single time, so 0% flake rate. Um, Clearly, then it's impossible for them to ever flake in the future. Right, exactly. So, so um, that's obviously not right. And I think the reason is that there are other reference classes, like how often do people flake in general, that should get some weight in there as well. So maybe you say one reference class has a 100% chance they're going to show up, but then out of people as a whole, you know, uh, 20% of the time they flake. And maybe you want to take something that's in between those two. Yep, that makes a lot of sense. So uh, perhaps uh, the most famous example of reference class forecasting is with uh, people predicting how long it's going to take them to finish things. Do you want to describe that? Yeah. So very often when people are doing complex projects, long complex projects, they underestimate how long they'll take. They also underestimate often how much it'll cost, how many resources they'll use. Um, there's a bunch of theories around why this is. It's commonly called the planning fallacy. Um, one theory is that when you're thinking about a long complex project, you know that on some level that some things will go wrong, but it's very hard to know what will go wrong, right? It's going to be sort of idiosyncratic. And so your brain kind of just smooths over and says, well, this thing is probably not going to go wrong and that thing's probably going to go wrong. And so each individual thing, you kind of assume it's going to go right. 
But of course, there's a good chance something will go wrong that you never even thought of. Mm. Yeah. So I think uh, trying to estimate how long this would take is a, is a case where I basically only use the outside view and I try to just completely ignore the inside, inside view because it just seems so unreliable and biased. Well, I think one way to use the inside view, and, and if you're thinking about like planning a big project, you kind of use your inside view to try to break the project down to as many pieces as possible. Mm. You say, given what I know about this project, I think it's going to involve this and this and this and this. And once you've kind of decomposed it in these small pieces, which are easier to estimate, you, you could use, for example, reference cost forecasting on the individual pieces, hmm. which I think potentially might be more reliable unless you have a really good reference class for the whole thing, right? If, you, if you've done projects very much like this one many, many times, great. But very often that's not the case. Like, you know, if you're writing your second book, you may only have written one book. That's not, you know, sure, that's better than zero books, but it's not necessarily a wonderful reference class. Maybe this book will take three times longer because of something about this book. Yeah, I mean, in that case, you probably look at uh, how often do people finish books in general, or you, yeah, you give a bit of weight to all these things. So, yes, so, you, exactly. so probably you should originally start out with what, how, how long does it take people in general, and how, and how often do they finish, and then you update a bit uh, that you're maybe better than average if you did manage to finish your first book and do it on time. Kind of up, updating that prior, yeah. and we actually we have a module on clearthinking.org about how to help fight the planning fallacy, and we mm-hmm. actually teach you reference class forecasting. So if you're interested, then check that out. Yeah, this kind of outside view stuff can uh, make you a little bit cynical. Uh, maybe cynical is not quite the right word. Um, pessimistic <laughs> all the time because uh, people often have so many uh, delusions about uh, how their own life is going to go. But that is just extremely atypical. Like they, they tend to think that their relationships are going to go on forever. They think they're probably going to get the jobs that they're applying for at least some of the time. I uh, think they're going to like finish their tasks. And uh, I do often hear people say, oh, yeah, I'm planning to do this thing during, during my summer. And I'm just like, no, you're not. <laughs> I don't always say that. I don't always say that, but I'm thinking in my head. <laughs> but most people, most people who are doing something that ambitious over summer don't finish. So I think uh, typically, typically uh, you're going to be let's say, the same as they are. Yeah. And, you know, and I think it, it can be demoralizing sometimes if people take the outside view. And you know, like, let's say you're running a startup yeah. and you say, well, you know, if nine out of 10 startups fail, like, why do I think Mike could possibly succeed? And I think one way I like to think about that is, is reframing it from like a single discrete thing to a process you're running. Hmm. You're like, okay, yes, this exact incarnation of this thing I'm doing has a high probability of not working. But if I'm willing to stick with this for years and iterate and learn and get better each time and, and, you know, pivot as needed, that the whole process has a much higher likelihood of success. Hmm. You know, so, so taking this kind of bigger view that you're, it's not, you know, it's not like the world ends if you don't do this exact thing that you're trying to do. Yeah. Okay, so let's move on from uh, reference class forecasting to thinking about more specific kinds of evidence. Uh, so one kind of evidence that people are often confronted with is explicit models or theories that people have about how the world works. Um, for example, you know, I studied economics and you'll be presented with a specific model of, say, supply and demand or, uh, you know, asymmetric information that people are claiming applies to a specific case. Yeah, in what, in what situations do you think people should update a lot based on models and theories? And in what cases should they be more skeptical? Well, I think it's really important to understand, you know, as the famous quote says, all models are wrong, but some models are useful. Mm. And every model is limited in the sense that it will sometimes mis- make mispredictions. Mm. So it's very useful to go out and absorb a bunch of different models about the way the world works, but you also have to absorb to some degree what domain the thing applies. Mm. You know, if you think about, for example, uh, Newton's equations of physics, those are really accurate in a lot of cases. But there are some cases they're actually going to really mispredict what is happening. Mm. So it's really useful to learn about those, but just also know that if you're in a certain situation, it's not going to work as well. Another thing I think about models that can be really valuable to think about that people underestimate is that trying to form your own models is really valuable, even if those models will will sometimes maybe often be wrong. Because what happens is so you you have some experiences if you don't try to form a model, then you may have trouble ever like generalizing to a lot of different cases. Hmm. But if you force yourself to try to think of a model like, okay, what, what do, what's my understanding of why this thing keeps happening? Or what's my understanding of this situation? Uh, and why, and how to predict these situations in the future? Then suddenly you have something that can be refuted, right? Hmm. Now, we, first of all, when you go into the situation again, you have a prediction because you have a model that you can draw on a kind of explicit theory. Hmm. You can also then say, oh, I mispredicted that. You know, if there's a really bad misprediction, maybe I should start thinking about whether there's a flaw in the model. Maybe I can make it better. And so once you actually force yourself to have a model, you can start proving yourself wrong and you can start improving that model, making it better. And then what's really cool about that is then you can actually teach it to others. If you only have an intuitive model, it's very, very hard to give it to anyone else. But once you have it more explicit, you can you can share it with the world and help other people have more accurate predictions. Yeah. So a common issue that people raise with models and theories and kind of calculations that people do is that they can often lead to kind of quite extreme claims um, that then rely on on the model being true. Um, And I know uh, 
a lot of people in, in effective altruism that uh, they tend to be very skeptical of, of any claim that relies specifically, or, or especially on like one model or theory uh, of, of the world. On the other hand, uh, there is a risk that if, if that theory is correct and it makes a very strong claim or it says that one thing is especially important, that if you're just uh, generically skeptical of all of them and you don't like updating based on a single piece of evidence, that you could miss out on some really big opportunities. Um, yeah, what, what, what do you think about that whole general debate? Yeah, I, ge- I generally think it's a good idea to try to rely on multiple models when possible. Mm-hmm. For example, imagine there's a situation where you have a bunch of people independently making a forecast for a thing. Mm-hmm. It's generally found that averaging their their predictions together tends to outperform most of the individuals in the group. Mm -hmm. And this makes perfect sense because not knowing who's better, if we kind of a priori assume each of them is equally likely to be as good as all the others, why would we pick one person's over over the others? But if they're somewhat independent, if they're very independent or somewhat independent predictions, they might have some biases that go in opposite directions. So by averaging them together, you kind of maybe cancel out some of that bias Mm -hmm. and you also reduce noise. Uh, potentially by averaging them together. And I think the same thing goes for models. If you have multiple models that make a prediction about a thing, why not look at what each of them predicts? Hmm. And then you can start thinking about averaging their predictions or at least asking, well, in this situation, do I have some reason to think that one model will be more accurate than another? Hmm. Rather than just relying on kind of one model, I think, which tends to produce very bad predictions. Okay, so then um, probably the other uh, key piece of evidence that people get is uh, empirical measurements. Uh, so perhaps you might see a study that uh, claims that, yeah, chocolate is particularly uh, good good for your cardiovascular health or something like that. Um, do you have any, have any comments on that kind of uh, evidence and when you should update? Yeah, so I think, first of all, in my, in my view, it's very useful to always like, kind of try to have a prior, like hmm. saying, well, okay, be, uh, you know, I saw this study on chocolate for cardiovascular health. Did I have an opinion about that before? Mm. You know, what would, what, how likely would I think that would be before I saw the study? Mm. And I think that can be clarifying. And then you think, okay, now that I saw the study, should I be much more confident? And, and you know, again, that goes back to the question of evidence. Mm. How likely am I see, to see this evidence of this study result, given the hypothesis that, that chocolate actually reduces or improves cardiovascular health versus if it doesn't. Mm. And, you know, then that's going to bring in your view on like, oh, well, how reliable are studies and, and how reliable studies in this particular domain mm. and so on. So studies are just one form of evidence. And I think that's easy to miss. You know, I think I think that people, you know, they, uh, some people just don't care about science. They reject it, which I think is a big mistake. Mm. But other people, they think that science is the only way to answer questions, which is also, I think, a mistake because there are other forms of evidence. Um, so, for example, you know, if if uh, you walk into your apartment and there's a stranger standing there, that's very strong evidence that there's a person in front of you. If sure, you might be hallucinating, mm-hmm. but it's very strong evidence. It's not scientific evidence. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not a repeatable trial. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it, you know, it's not like you did a study, but it, it is worth not discounting these other forms of evidence and trying to integrate them, right? So you got these study results. You have to integrate that with the other evidence you have. Maybe your intuitive psychological, for example, let's say you're evaluating a psych study that has some really counterintuitive psychological result. You have to combine that evidence from the study with your intuitive psychological model of the way humans work to kind of really those are two models of the situation. You want to synthesize them. Yeah. So I guess if you're reading a paper, you, you kind of want to estimate the Bayes factor that this paper presents to you, uh, which I suppose would go up if the sample was bigger or if the methodology was bigger. Uh, and it would go down uh, if you thought that the um, authors were untrustworthy uh, or perhaps if there was yet yeah, a bias in what things got published and what things didn't or if like only the most exciting results got published and um, negative results didn't. Exactly. Yeah. All those factors. You can kind of make a list of a bunch of these factors. Mm. You know, if the P values are really small, mm. um, that should tilt you a little bit more towards believing it compared to if the P values are you know, P equals 0.04, mm. where actually that's a little bit less evidence yeah. potentially, or maybe that actually could be evidence that they kind of did some funny tricks to get it right below P equals 0.05. Yeah, I guess, I mean, most listeners are going to be familiar with those points, but maybe it is clarifying to think that you're trying to estimate this Bayes factor, which is the probability of seeing this paper if the, if the theory were, or if the claim were true versus probably seeing it if it was false. And exactly. all of these other uh, things that we look at, the reason that they matter is that they change that Bayes ratio. Exactly. And so suppose that, Bef- suppose you do this thought experiment, like how likely would I be-, be to believe the psych result before I saw this paper? And let's say you think it's wildly unlikely. You're like one in a hundred, right? Then you see this paper that seems fairly convincing. Well, is the base factor, it's fairly convincing. Is the base factor 10? Cause that would go 10 times one in a hundred would only get you to 10 over a hundred. So the odds would only be 10 to a hundred. So it'd still be very, very likely to be false. Hmm. Not as likely as before, but still very likely. Hmm. Or is the base factor more like hundred, right? If the base factor was a hundred, then you'd go from a 100 odds before 
multiply by 100, you get 100 to 100. So now it's 50 50, hmm. right? So, so it's like sort of what did I think before? And then trying to adjust for the evidence. And, and also, you know, I think that there is a debate the extent to which papers really provide really strong evidence. But even if you take the view that a lot of st- studies are flawed and this kind of thing, one thing that's cool about studies is they raise hypotheses to attention. Hmm. I mean, there's a, the number of hypotheses possible is, is so insanely large. Hmm. You, you know, there's no way in your lifetime you'll ever consider even a tiny fraction of all the hypotheses. Hmm. So a paper can raise a hypothesis to attention that you would never have thought about before. And then you can start to consider, do I think that's true? Maybe you can go gather other evidence about whether it's true or not. Hmm. Yeah, another kind of evidence that evidence that's worth mentioning is heuristics or kind of qualitative frameworks uh, that that you can use uh, to estimate things. So uh, these days, actually, when we're trying to um, evaluate the um, when we're trying to prioritize the world's problems, uh, we use a quantitative framework where we, where we stick numbers on things and try to estimate specific things like you know how many people are affected and how much. But before we did that, we had a qualitative framework that where we're just kind of scoring different problems on like how big were they in scale, how hard were they to solve, how many people are working on it, and it was more just like high, medium, low. And sometimes you just have to do that because you can't really, or it's just too difficult to, to attach a numerical measurement to something. But nonetheless, there can be a lot of informational content there. So I guess another case where I think qualitative frameworks can work quite well is with uh, hiring, for example. So if you're considering hiring someone, a lot of people advocate this uh, kind of heuristic or this qualitative rule. It's like, are you excited about them? Uh, and if you're not excited about hiring the person, then basically uh, you shouldn't. And the th- I think that that's capturing something where you, you maybe not be, you can't put this on a spreadsheet because uh, it's, it's capturing some like, yeah, gestalt judgment or some overall judgment that otherwise you might miss out on. And you, and you need to update based on, based on that as well. Do you have any comments on that? Well, you know, this goes back to the, the point about like the human brain is a kind of predictive machine, hmm. right? And so like all the data we gather is like fed into this predictive machine. Mm. And so one way to like reframe all this is not like, is this heuristic accurate or is this model accurate or is a study accurate? But like, is this, imp- if I think of myself as a predictive machine, am I a better predictive machine when I have these tools? Mm. Right. And I think that's where like heuristics can be really useful is that they can be a quick way of making a judgment that kind of like adds on to our predictive machine in a particular domain, mm. right? Um, now, going into hiring, I think that's a really interesting example because I think that people are often actually very biased in hiring. Mm. They they often misjudge the quality of evidence. For example, I think that people often think that resumes are much more predictive than they are. Mm. And I have a personal experience around this where um, one of my employees and I were, were thinking about hiring someone else to do the same role that she was doing. Mm. And basically, we both judged a bunch of resumes by rating them by how good we thought they were for the job. Mm. Can you guess what the correlation is between our ratings of the resumes? Zero. It was basically zero. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which, you know, was shocking at the time. But I think I've really come around and thinking that, you know, it's not that resumes contain no information. Certainly, they contain some information. Mm. But I think that a lot of people overestimate the amount of information they contain. And another thing about that kind of qualitative judgment people make when they're hiring is I think it can also be overly influenced by like things like how good you feel interacting. Mm. And so that's heuristic of like, do I feel excited? Mm. Maybe some of that excitement is just like, you like the person. And now that that's completely irrelevant, like it is nice to like the people you work with, but maybe it's not as important as, you know, you feel it is intuitively. But that being said, I think there is a role for qualitative heuristics in some, some cases. Yeah, I think people often advocate for them as kind of an, uh, an error protection or that uh, very often you... By having a whole bunch of different like rules of thumb or yeah, uh, call it just just general descriptors that you put on something, it avoids you giving too much weight to any one piece of evidence that you can just define very clearly and put a number on. Yeah, because sometimes putting a number on a thing, you know, we tend to then try to maximize that number, mm. and often that leads to weird bad results where you know you're losing the bigger picture of like what you actually care about. Okay, so let, let's push on. Uh, after you've kind of uh, produced an estimate or something or a probability uh, judgment. We always try to compare it to something else or give a sense of like, how does this fit into the broader picture of other beliefs that we have to see whether we've made a mistake somewhere. And I think, um, one of, one of my favorites is, uh, I, um, once, uh, posted something on my Facebook about the, the value of the Dutch East India company or something in the 16th or 17th century, uh, which said that it was a, a, an extremely large number. And I didn't do any checks to see whether this was accurate or not, uh, cause it seemed like it came from a credible source. But someone pointed out that uh, this was uh, basically uh, as large. Uh, th- this would mean that the Dutch East India Company was basically as valuable as all wealth in the world at the time. So they so they found something you could compare it to, which is like the total amount of wealth that everyone had, and say like, is it plausible that the Dutch East India Company represents a hundred percent of that? Uh, not really. Mm-hmm, <laughs> so that, so mm-hmm. that gave strong evidence that it was false. And then when we chased it up, it just seemed to be one of these cases where this is a citation uh, wormhole, where like no one <laughs> knows where the original claim actually comes from, and there's, there's right. no evidence for it. Um, yeah, do you have any uh, examples of interesting cases where you've managed? 
managed to catch an error uh, by like checking the, the answer against something else? Well, I think one really useful procedure can be basically having like a, a sort of a rundown of like, oh, what are the sorts of mistakes I might be making hmm. in this particular case? And actually, we um, we built this tool called the Decision Advisor on hmm. clearthinking.org that walks you through making a big life decision. Hmm. And our idea was like, bring the bias training to the moment of the decision hmm. so that like as you're making the decision, we're saying, oh, is this a, an emotionally difficult decision? Is this a decision where you might be suffering from some cost fallacy? And so we're like kind of bringing it to that moment. And I think the same goes for if you're making a prediction about the world, you could ask yourself questions like, OK, but, you know, am I inferring, you know, do I actually have like a sufficiently large sample size to be like making, you know, making this kind of estimate? Mm. You know, what is my prior here? Am I ignoring my prior? Mm. You know, so there's like, you could kind of run down the common set of mistakes that people make. Mm. And of course you might catch them all, but, uh, you know, is this an, a reasonably large estimate? Like, like, like in your example. And I think this could potentially increase your predictive abilities. Okay. So. I kind of want to move on to uh, going through some specific examples of uh, things where we can perhaps start with our priors and, and then... Let's try it. Let's see if we can do it. Let's yeah, do it. yeah the, I had a few examples. So, right. so, so with the risk of being um, political, uh, which uh, I guess could could make us irrational or uh, could get people very excited. Um, yeah. What do you think are the odds that Trump personally uh, contributed to colluding with Russia in the sense that he gave like instructions to someone to pass on to Russia to tell them what to do during the election? Did you Have you, have you thought about this at all? You know, I have not tried to estimate the odds of this. Okay, yeah. Um, but we could walk through how one might try to think right. about it. Yeah, it's almost better. So I guess, uh, well, yeah, what's the prior here? So... You know, so yeah, so let's talk about different, let's talk about different reference forecasts, right? Mm, yeah. uh, you could make, well, one reference would be like, how many presidents do we think have colluded with foreign powers? Yeah, I think it's probably 0%. Or probably really, you know, I would really imagine low. really low, yeah. right? Um, so I, that could be a starting point. Yeah. But other, you know, other things that we could think about is like, are there examples of Trump specifically? We could try yeah. to make a reference cast around him. Are yeah. there examples of him specifically, you know, making, let's say, the self-serving back, back room dealings? And, mm. you know, I don't actually know the data on that, whether yeah. there's, it's known whether he's done that before in other domains. But if you did know that, then maybe that would, that would give you a, a start, uh, like a higher starting prior on whether he would have done it with Russia. Yeah, I guess you could also just look at how often do people uh, do schemes like that in general, not just a uh, president specifically, or how often have presidents kind of committed crimes or done things that, yeah, so you've got all of these other, uh, yeah, just similar, somewhat similar cases that go into your overall judgment. And to be honest, I think that caused me to think that it was pretty unlikely, actually, um, because also, yeah, just my gut feeling, at least uh, when, when people first started talking about this, was that although like Trump, he's pretty impulsive, but would he be this silly? Uh, it seems... Uh, it's, it, it's, I mean, it's quite a remarkable claim, I suppose, that uh, someone running for president uh, colluded with a yeah, hostile foreign power. So, well, so you my know, prior I, starting out was like low, 10% maybe. Well, you know, I think one thing that happens here is that for someone who really, really, really doesn't like Trump, hmm. I think there's a temptation to hmm. agree with anything bad about him. Yeah. And, and, you know, so you have to know and be introspective of what mode are you in? Are you in the mode of like bashing him with your friends or are you in the mode of actually trying to figure out the truth about the world? Hmm. And if you're in the mode of, actually trying to figure out the truth of the world, you have to separate out like what you want to be true mm, from what actually is true from what, what actually what is true. Support? Yeah. And it's, it's quite difficult to do that when you're very impassioned about a subject. Yeah. Okay. And then I guess, uh, the main thing that I have updated on since then is, uh, this, uh, case of, um, his son meeting with, uh, like a Kremlin contact, uh, at, at, at Trump tower. Mm -hmm. Um, that was the first time that I started taking this uh, potentially seriously because it, that, because I would have, that said that that was very unlikely because it uh, seems uh, f fairly outrageous. Right. Like, so if we apply the question of evidence to that, yeah. how likely do you think it is that that would happen if your hypothesis, if the hypothesis that he colluded with Russia is true so compared to if it's not true? It seems, yeah. I mean, it does seem like the, the base factor is reasonably large. Like, hmm. it seems like quite a lot more likely to happen if he did collude with Russia than if he didn't. Would yeah. you agree with that? Yeah, I think, yeah. So let, let's say, like, that's it. If I knew that they had colluded, what would be the odds that something like this would have happened? Oh, I guess that I would see that it had happened. Yeah, maybe like 80, 80 percent. And, would, the, and the then, you have to like, then you have to compare that mm, to, yeah, to the, the odds of it happening if, if uh, yeah. he did include with Russia. I guess, yeah. To be honest, I haven't put numbers on this. So, yeah, so maybe this is helpful. But like 20 or 30 percent. So maybe it's giving me a base factor of like three or four. Yeah, I might even put it a little bit higher than that. But Interesting. Yeah. Okay. So then if I uh, it was originally 10 percent, uh, then what would it be? So that was that's a one to nine ratio. Now I'm at four to nine. Uh, or yeah, or three to nine. So it's gone from 10% to 30 or 40%. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. Okay. 
What about uh, the probability that the US and China goes to war in the 21st century? Um, mm. There's kind of a famous reference class forecaster for this, which is um, fr from memory, I think it's that nine out of 13 times that there's been a big uh, transition in uh, which is the most uh, militarily powerful country in the world. Uh, they've, they've gone to war. That's a terrifying reference. It is a terrifying, yeah. A lot of people won't talk about this. I'll, yeah. stick up, I'll stick up a link to um, a book that discusses this. Um, it, has a, it has a name that escapes me right now. So I guess, yeah, if you were just going to take that reference class, you'd say there's, uh, what, a 70% chance or something like that, that, that they'll go to war. But um, I think there's good reasons not to only take that reference class. Yeah, do uh, we have any other reference class for, uh, that we can use for the forecast? Yeah, so get just, well, I suppose like the broadest reference class would just be how often do two um, random countries go to war in a century? Much lower than that. Yeah. Uh, what would be like a more narrow one? Well, what's, what's the chance that two great powers go to go to war yeah. in a given century? It's probably somewhere in between those two. Yeah, and, and as we talked about before, as you narrow in, you're going to get less and less data, hmm. but it's going to be more and more relevant to the case since you're right. going to try to balance the, the like, more data, less relevant, less data, more relevant. Yeah. I think that the other reason that you definitely wouldn't want to take uh, just this probability is that there's been a kind of a regime change since this last happened, which is that nuclear weapons have been invented, which seems to have reduced the, the probability of war in general. Uh, so you can't just look at all these historical case studies, many of which are centuries ago, uh, when right. the world was very different. Because with nuclear war, nuclear war, it becomes like much worse for both parties to go to war. Yeah. And then I guess day to day, I guess you see, you know, these kind of diplomatic spats between countries. Uh, there's like current issues around trade between the US and China. And I guess, yeah, we can always just ask this question. What's, what's the, uh, the Bayes factor? So what would be the likelihood of seeing the US and China arguing about uh, tariffs if they are going to go to war during this century versus if they are not? Right. It seems like often it's just going to be pretty close to one. It's, yeah, like, it's not it's moving not, a lot. It's not going it? to move a lot, I think, in that case. And, you know, this actually raises an important point, which we haven't touched on yet, which is that making sure that you don't a double value at the same evidence. You don't, mm. you don't double count. Mm. So for example, let's say you get one piece of evidence about tariffs, you know, China and the U S squabbling over tariffs. Mm. And then you get another piece of evidence about them squabbling over some other issue. But maybe those two issues are actually very related. And like mm. the fact that one happened actually makes the other very likely to happen. So even if one of them had a pretty large base factor, then it, it actually may mean the other, you shouldn't update on the other one because it's almost the same, same piece of evidence. Yeah. That makes sense. Okay, yeah, what, what things might update us a lot? I guess if you actually saw them engaged in a proxy war, that seems to, in the past, be very predictive of uh, yeah, countries going to war more, more generally. Uh, Th actually, threats of war, certainly. The would, threats of war, right. Yeah, that, then like, you've got like a serious thing. Facebook. with North Korea, right? And like, yeah, yeah. Yeah, let, let, let's talk about North Korea. So what, what, what do you think are the odds that North Korea will uh, give up its uh, nuclear weapons? Uh, I guess we'll start, start with the prior as always. Like, well, yeah, what, what kind of reference class are we looking at? Yeah, well, are there any historical examples of co countries giving up nuclear weapons? Uh, I think South Africa gave up its plan to do so. Um, and Libya, I think, gave up its nuclear weapons. All right, um, so, so there are a couple. There's a couple, yeah. Uh, but there are quite a few nations that have nuclear weapons. And didn't give them up. Yeah. And didn't give them up. So it's like maybe one or two out of uh, ten, something like that. Okay, so it seems unlikely. There, that then I guess, should we move on to specific things about this case? Uh, yeah, so I think, you know, I think one thing about the, the North Korea case mm -hmm. is does having nuclear weapons serve a very important strategic strategy that they have? Um, because if it doesn't, if there's not really any reason not to give them up, we'd think they'd be much more likely to give them up. Whereas if yeah. there's a really strong reason to, to not give them up, then maybe they won't. Yeah, I guess we're, we're slightly rushing through this. But yeah, my, my guess is that they're not going to give them up. And it is because most countries that got nuclear weapons haven't. And also they seem to have very strong incentives to keep them because as long as, as, long as they have nuclear weapons or, you know, as long as we think that they probably have nuclear weapons, then we're much less likely to threaten them and they can save money even on other military things. You, yeah, you'd imagine it gives them great negotiating power and also may greatly reduce the chance of invasion hmm. uh, because, you know, who wants to invade someone with nuclear weapons, right? Yeah. Okay. I mean, are, are there any arguments in favor of them giving it up that, that we should... Consider? Well, has there been any news stories that we should update on? Okay. Yeah. Well, they've said that they are going to give them up. Well, they keep talking about this. Um, and yet I place almost no weight on this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we can ask the question of evidence. Hmm. How much more likely would they be to say that they would give them up if they actually are going to give them up than if they're not? I'd say a bit, a bit more likely at least. Hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, do, you, do you want to put any numbers on it? Um, try to give a factor. I would say probably three to one. Three to one. Interesting. Do you think it's okay. less than that? Yeah, I think because so. Because keep in mind, if they weren't going to give them up, why, why would, would they say this particular random thing? Hmm. You see what I'm saying? Like the fact that they chose to say this particular thing. Yeah. It does seem in a world where they're not going to give them up, it would be a weird thing to go out and say. But, but that's the thing. I think that if they, if they weren't going to give them up, then uh, they would have reason to say that they're going to do it anyway. 
uh, such that like it's almost even if they were going to give it up, it's almost impossible for them to communicate. Okay. Well, this would be my model. Well, if that's, that's, if that's, 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 that's they're trying to suck us in uh, to like try to get concessions from us, uh, get us to do things that they like, try to make us less worried, so we stop pressuring them so much. And so they going to str- my my model is that they're going to string us along and claim to do it. Um, mm. And they may not even have decided whether they're going to, but they're like it's, it serves their interest to say this basically no matter what. That makes sense. Although that seems to be just one strategy among multiple they could have run. Yeah. So how confident are you they would have run that strategy? Assuming they're assuming they're not going to give them up, how likely would they have chosen that strategy mm. instead of another? Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Maybe I'm, I'm being. Yeah, it's true. Like the, the view from inside my head is like just don't listen to a word that they say. But like maybe I'm wrong about that model of how they're operating. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, I would argue that's not quite the right model. Mm. Like the, the, the right model to update on evidence is the question of evidence. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and, and so, you know, in a world where they're not going to give them up, mm. you have to say, well, how likely would they be to use this particular strategy? I see. I mean, it doesn't seem shockingly unlikely, but, mm. but maybe there's at least two or three different strategies they could have used. Maybe only mm. one of them involves like pretending they're going to give them up or something like that. Yeah. Okay. So obviously we could have spent a lot more time talking about this, but maybe we're starting with 10%. Then, uh, we're updating downwards because we think it doesn't make sense for them to give it up. But then we're going to update back upwards because we think, uh, well, that what at least they said. And that's some information. Some information. So it goes from like 10 to five to 15 or something like that. Yeah. Are there any, any other cases that you'd be interested in talking about? I've got some others here. Oh, you go for it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Someone wrote in and was very interested to, to hear your view on dietary advice. Uh, so they're saying, you know, I have a degree in physiology, but it's still baffled uh, about what meta analyses or like experts I should trust. Um, uh, when it, it comes to dietary advice. And typically, uh, they say they just stick to, you know, uh, vegetables are generally good. Uh, lots of sugar isn't that good. And kind of, they don't think that there's a, a whole lot else that, that we know. Um, what, what's your view? Yeah. I think, I think dietary advice is a really interesting question. Um, I think part of the problem here is that I've come to believe that humans are, are much more different from each other hmm. than is maybe generally acknowledged. Yeah. In other words, like, the fundamental question of should you eat X or should you eat Y is maybe a malformed question. Mm. Maybe some people should eat X and some people should eat Y, right? Mm. Maybe it depends on their biology. Maybe it depends on their behavior, like how much they exercise or, or what environment they live in. So maybe in some sense, we're asking questions that are too simple. Mm. Uh, but the problem is it's, it's very hard even to ask the more complex questions and answer them. Because in order to actually really study this stuff in a really rigorous way, we'd often need to like randomize people to get different diets for long periods of time and make sure they actually eat those diets. That's very expensive. It's very difficult. How do you even ensure that someone's eating the right diet that they mm. claim? Yeah. You know, it's, it's possible to do this, but it's, it's rare, right? Mm. Furthermore, if you don't randomize people, right, you just, let's say you just observe, oh, these people eat spinach and these people eat meat, who's healthier? The problem is if you're not randomizing them to eat spinach, well, eating spinach is probably also correlated with like eating kale and eating carrots and so on. So how do you know it's the spinach, not the carrots or kale that's having an effect on their, on their health? Hmm. Um, so I, I think that this field in particular, it's very hard to really update that much on the evidence. Yeah. Yeah. So that's kind of my view as well, except with, with, with a handful of exceptions. So just like, yeah, all of the evidence that people seem to present for particular foods being especially healthy or unhealthy just don't seem terribly convincing. They don't have a big base factor. So I'm just kind of mostly just sticking to my prior. I guess what's, what's my prior? I guess my prior is that most of these specific claims just kind of aren't true, that most things just don't have that much effect on, on people's health. And so even after I see all this evidence, I'm still like, I still don't think that we know all that much. We don't know like any specific, that many specific claims. Yeah. Well, you know, I think, um, sugar, one case against sugar is that some people think that it, like some studies indicate that it causes like all kinds of bad health effects and so on. Maybe you don't believe the studies that much, maybe you do, mm. but at the best, it's just empty calories, right? At the best, it has no nutritional value. Yeah. So, you know, the, the, for sugar, like the range is mm. no nutritional value, empty calories yeah. to it's actually bad, like very specifically bad for you. Mm. So, you know, there's not really much upset on sugar, yeah, except there's that so many people good. arguing in its favor. So yeah, this, it tastes good. So that's yeah. the main <laughs> <I suppose, reason>. yeah. <laughs> that matters. I guess uh, the, the case that I imagine that we both can see that we do have pretty strong evidence is about uh, specific nutritional deficiencies uh, where you can observe someone having uh, you know, very bad ill health in a specific way. And right, it's consistent scurvy. across lots of people. Scurvy. Yeah, scurvy, classic cases. Like, what is the base factor on uh, you know, every time someone doesn't consume vitamin C, they have all of these same symptoms. And then as soon as they take vitamin C, they start to go away and we can just replicate it again and again. The base factor is like enormous, you know, 100, 1,000. Uh, so that, yeah. that's the kind of case where it's like, yes, I would have had a very low prior on this specific claim that vitamin C does all of these things. But then uh, I started with, you know, 1%, 0.1%, but now I've had a 100,000 fold update in, in the favor of that being true. Personally, I've had a very demoralizing experience of looking into different supplements mm. where, you know, you have these supplements where it looks at first like the evidence is like quite strong and maybe it's really helpful. And the more you investigate and the more you read the studies, it's kind of like, 
the stories don't really hold together that well mm. to the point where it's actually pretty hard to find supplements that like a healthy person that doesn't have any specific issues should just be taking every day. Mm. Um, one possible exception is there does seem to be some evidence that uh, older women especially should potentially take vitamin D. Mm. You know, I'm not going to say I definitely absolutely believe that, but yeah. there are meta analyses of randomized control trials that do seem that, that indicate this is helpful mm. for older women. But, you know, there aren't a lot of results like that, that when you really dig in, you're like, oh, yeah, this is definitely the case. Yeah. Yeah. My view on almost all of this stuff is uh, kind of, you know, it might be true and it's not that expensive and it doesn't seem like downsides so large. Yeah. So, that, so you end up giving it a go. But, you know, in any specific case, probably not, not going to help that much. Yeah. And then actually, so one of the things I find really interesting is when someone switches diets and has a, it's a seemingly huge effect. Mm. Right now, like like, you know, they used to eat whatever and now they became vegan and suddenly their arthritis that they had for 10 years seems to go away. Mm. Now, of course, in those cases, we can be skeptical. We can say, well, are they sure that they're remembering properly? Did they really have arthritis for 10 years? Maybe they had it for two months. Yeah. Uh, Maybe these things just go into remission anyway at times. Yeah. Right. But we can actually use Bayesian way of thinking about this. Yeah. And we can say, well, how likely... Let, let's suppose that we knew the details of the case were correct. Mm. They had bad arthritis for 10 years. Mm. They switched diets. And then, you know, within two weeks, it went away completely. Yeah. Right. And let's say it's never gone away before in the 10 years. Yeah. Well, we can we can begin to think about it in a Bayesian way. If we know that those are the facts... We can say, well, how likely would be this, this evidence of it going away in two weeks mm. if our hypothesis that the diet change was the cause of it going away was true compared to if it's not true. And if you think about two weeks divided by 10 years, mm. if it had never if it had never gone away before, that's actually like pretty strong base factor. Yeah. It's right. It's a really strong base factor. Yeah. If, if it happens that quickly, although your prior on the diet, getting rid of the astral just might be very low. You might, might be thought, very it's low. Just very, so maybe it's a 1% or like a one in a thousand chance you had before, but then you get this like update that's like what? Potentially very strong. Potentially very large. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, but it's interesting to think about how if you had something that's very consistent for a very long time and then there's a sudden, then then you do something purposely with the hypothesis that's going to change the thing, yeah. and then that thing very rapidly changes. Yeah. You can have huge base factors that could be convincing in n equals one mm. without like a randomized control trial that that actually works for, at least for that person. It doesn't mean it'll generalize to other people. Yeah, it's interesting that the rapidity matters so much because it reduces the probability of a false positive quite a lot. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So just try to estimate another thing. So uh, the odds of uh, Trump being reelected, say. So. Uh, that's one where we have pretty explicit models and lots of data such that our estimates can be uh, fairly robust, at least compared to some of these other things that we're trying to estimate, which are more like individual uh, unique cases. I think it's, it seems like the things that we have the best modeling for and the best probability judgments for are kind of sports results and the weather. And then elections are not quite as good as that because the data set's not quite as large. But, but we do have mm -hmm. prediction markets, which are mm -hmm. interesting potential priors say, well, mm -hmm. if we actually have betting markets where people are putting their money on this, Maybe we start with the odds of the betting market as a, as a, as our prior. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's say that we uh, we didn't have the betting market because that's almost cheating because they've done all the work for us. So they probably uh, people pe listeners at home should do that, and that's that's what I usually do myself. I, I guess what what we can do is look at the polling data and then say what fraction of the time that the the polling has been the way that it is now has one side won versus the other when the difference was was what it was. Mm -hmm. And of course, then, uh, well, if you only look at presidential elections, then you've got a fairly small sample because they only happen every four years. And also many of them will be quite a long time ago when the situation might have been different. Um, but nonetheless, you got like a dozen that, that seem pretty relevant. You could also uh, try to be more fine grained and look at like how often does the difference, uh, like what's the kind of time series nature of, of the change in the, in the vote difference between the mm -hmm. two parties. Uh, so you get a sense of like what's the variance um, over a year. Uh, yeah, how, how quickly, uh, yeah, how rapidly do these things uh, evolve? Mm -hmm. um, so you got yeah, uh, explicit time series models. I, I guess so, so. That's the that's the kind of more explicit quantitative side. Then people also kind of apply their own judgment, I suppose, uh, to like, you know, do we think that this person's likely to do a good job? Do we think they're a good campaigner? It seems like most experts think that, or most people who I trust on this, think that people used to place way too much weight on that kind of personal uh, qualitative judgment about the situation. Right. I think sometimes people. You know, some something breaks, some scandal, something like that, and yeah. people's probably judgments, you know, change dramatically. Mm. But then, you know, next week everyone's kind of forgotten about it. Yeah, yeah they're not considering the outside view. Yeah, how often does a scandal like this actually change the results in the long term? Right, right. And I mean, obviously, a sufficiently bad scandal might really wreck someone's career. But if it's a kind of minor thing, well, a lot of times mm. people just get eventually forget, they get over it, whatever. Yeah. Do, do you have any comments on, on this kind of, of case of how people ought to treat it? I suppose you think uh, start with the prediction market and then uh, adjust from there. Yeah. And, you know, and it's interesting. Can you beat the prediction market? Mm. It might be pretty tricky. If it's a really liquid market where you have 
professionals who are like spending all day long trying to beat the market to make money, it might be really hard to beat it. And as an amateur, you probably should just go with the probability they gave. Yeah. But let's say it's a market that's not that liquid. There are not that many people trading it and they're not professionals. They're just people with gut judgment. Then you can say, okay, this is what the prediction market says. This is the odds it gives. Do I have reason to think that the prediction market might over or underestimate in this particular case? Hmm. Like, do I think maybe, you know, there are a lot of anti-Trump people who are playing this prediction market hmm. who might be letting their personal biases, like, and hmm. what they want to be true, change their probabilities. Yeah. I guess, uh, yeah, let's apply a base factor to a specific poll uh, that comes out. Sure. So if, so if we get it, yeah, a poll on the, yeah, um, generic Democrat versus uh, Trump for the presidential election right now, I mean, what would be our base factor? One, basically? Nothing, uh, more or less, because I suppose we should have already absorbed all of the other polling information that's come out. We're so far away from the election. Um, if it was a surprising result, we probably wouldn't trust it anyway. Well, I think if it was sufficiently strong, like, hmm. you know, if, if, if Trump just seemed to be getting creamed, even by people who are traditional hmm. conservatives, that would be pretty interesting. And then maybe you'd start to think, well, maybe this, but, but it wouldn't, you know, probably wouldn't be huge, but it wouldn't be a phase factor of 40 yeah. because there's still so much uncertainty about how things will pan out. Yeah. But if you got a really surprising result that was inconsistent with like all of the other polls that were done in the last week or the last month, you might just think that they made a mathematical error. If it, if it was surprising enough to move it, uh, given that one poll is so small in the scheme of things, then... Well, that, that's a great point. I think about this with studies in psychology. Hmm. Um, as the effect size of the study, like the, the strength of the effect hmm. goes up, my base factor goes up, like my probability that this is a real result goes up. Because if it's a really small effect... Maybe it's just noise or well, it also is not that useful. But as the effect size goes up, I tend to believe it more. But then after some point, as the effect size gets too large, I actually start believing it less again mm. because then it becomes kind of, it seems unlikely that you'd, you'd actually have such a crazy strong effect. Yeah. And so you kind of get this thing where you're probably up and then it goes down again. And then at some point you're like, yeah, maybe that's a fraud. Like yeah. maybe they did, or, or they really mess something up somewhere. Yeah. Maybe, maybe an easier example is, uh, let's say, you know, you have a sense of how warm the room is, uh, and then you go and look at the thermometer. Uh, let's say that I thought that it was 20 degrees, and then I look at the thermometer and it says it's 25. I'd be like, huh, it was, it was warmer than I thought. If it says it's 30 degrees, it's like, wow, that's really quite surprising, but like, maybe I was wrong about the temperature. If it says it's 100 degrees, you're just like, well, I'm not updating on this at all, because clearly the thermometer is totally broken. Right, and one way to think about that is that you've, or you're, you're saying, well, what's the problem that I've got this evidence of the thermometer being like that, mm. given that the room is actually, you know, this temperature? Yeah. And that I assessed it being this temperature, right? Mm. You kind of have this additional thing that you're conditioning on, which is your own assessment of the temperature. And sort of once you've taken that into account, now the thermometer seems more likely to be broken. Mm. If you didn't have your own way of assessing, then all you'd have to update on is the thermometer. Yeah. So do you just want to break that down? Um, yeah. How does it look differently when you have your own judgment as well? Well, uh, you're taking it when you're saying, well, what's the problem? You know, how likely am I, am I to see that the thermometer says it's, you know, 3,000 degrees in my, in my house. Yeah. Uh, oh, given, given my sensation and the fact that, and the idea exactly. of the room being that temperature. Yeah. And now you're saying, well, it actually, you know, it actually seems like, you know, the, the most likely hypothesis is actually that it's broken because mm. I've conditioned on my own assessment, which is not going to be co that confused, right? Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, I guess, uh, so you see with uh, these prediction markets that they tend to move very gradually, uh, that um, what, yeah, individuals seem to like want to jump their, their probabilities around a lot. They tend to like not move and then like suddenly move a lot when they see something that, that somehow crashes through into their, their beliefs. But uh, yeah, at least liquid prediction markets, they didn't tend to just creep up like 1%, down 1% each day as like little bits of new information come in and people uh, slightly change their minds, which is probably how we ought to operate uh, if, if we were more reasonable. Yeah, absolutely. Because if you if you don't do those little adjustments, there'll be certain things you'll never change your mind about. The, the sorts of things where you never get overwhelming evidence all at once. And, hmm. um, you know, a perfectly rational agent doesn't care whether it gets three packets of evidence all together or them spread it across time, right? Yeah. Okay, here's another case. Uh, I've been reading this book, uh, Bad Blood, um, about uh, Theranos, uh, th this company that was going to do, um, yeah. that was going to revolutionize blood tests. Interestingly enough, I knew people that thought it was a fraud like, Oh, Eight years ago. Amazing. Okay. Yeah. So I was thinking, so the question is, yeah, someone comes to you in the Bay Area and they say, I've got this new amazing technology uh, that's going to yeah, change medicine. I can, I can yeah, do, this, do this incredible thing. How should you evaluate how likely it is to be a fraud or not? Well, I think usually the vast majority of cases, these are not frauds. They're mm. people who are 
overly optimistic, yeah. <laughs> you know, or which seems to be actually how this has started. That it was not a case; it was not an outright fraud from the beginning. Well, it wouldn't really make sense to start out on a plan of I'm going to go convince people that I'm going to create this technology, <laughs> but I'm not actually going to try to build it. Yeah. I'm just going to get a bunch of money and squander it. You know, like it, it doesn't make that much sense. It, it seems much more plausible that it's someone who like thought maybe they could do the thing, but then mm-hmm. as it becomes increasingly clear they can't do the thing, there's kind of such a momentum and inertia. Mm-hmm. And you've already told everyone you can do it and you've already got all their money, you know. You keep stringing it along, yeah, to delay what's, I guess, inevitable at that point. Okay, so uh, again, so let's start with the prior, start with the reference class. I guess what fraction of uh, cases are like over optimistic to the point that it's like borderline fraudulent? Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, if we're really talking about frauds, I think that there aren't that many really yeah, at the end of the percent. day. Yeah. A few percent. Yeah, it's pretty, mm-hmm. I think it's pretty small. Mm-hmm. Actually, so I'll give you a piece of evidence. So years ago, when I, uh, uh, someone I know claimed that they're in a fraud, I was really interested in this. And I went and looked at one of the papers that they published mm. and the paper was like really bad. <laughs> like, yeah. like, you know, you're reading this paper, you're like, what? This is really not convincing paper about right. their technology. Mm. And so, but that was a very confusing piece of evidence to me because you, if you were doing a fraud, you might think, well, you're just going to go out and you just make up all the data and mm-hmm. you have this beautiful result. But it was actually like the paper it, was so bad it almost had to be uh, like it had to be a sincere bad attempt. Well, you kind of thought, yeah, this looks like it. Up to, it made me think that their technology is less likely to be good. Mm. But actually, I'm not sure if it actually would make me think they were a fraud. It mm. might make me think they're like an honest but not very confident. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> interesting. Okay, so I think another phenomenon that I have here is that whenever people they'll often say, uh, "I've got this." Uh, new and somewhat surprising method that people report makes them feel a lot better. Yeah. Uh, I guess Theranos isn't a great example of this, but I am like extremely skeptical of these cases because we just have so many instances through history of people feeling like something has helped them. And in a sense it has, but all it's doing is giving them a placebo effect. You've got like faith healers or like religious stuff right. where, where I don't believe that there's like, well, there is a biological effect, but it's only psychosomatic. Well, yeah. this goes back to the, the idea we were talking about before, but like when can you learn something? When can your intuition learn something? Mm. Like, we have a very tight data feedback loop on like how we feel moment to moment and mm. whether it cha- it's changed. So if, you know, a faith healer touches you, you can tell that like suddenly you feel something different. Yeah. Now, maybe that's psychosomatic, but you know that you feel that. What's much harder to tell is, well, is your arthritis like slightly better now, you know, over the next few months? Or is that just like random variation, right? Yeah. Um, and so I think what happens is some of these things uh, don't work, but they can make you feel better momentarily. And then after that, maybe you happen to get better by chance or mm. you aren't really sure and you might read into it positively. Yeah, it's interesting because it seems like the intuitive plausibility of the mechanism matters so much here. Because if, if someone says, oh, I took this drug and it made me feel better, my prior on that being true is low for a specific chemical, but not that low because I, I know that drugs can change. Well, it's probably low if they pick the chemical completely randomly. That's true. Yeah. But if they if there was, let's say, a, you know, you knew that their doctor prescribed it, then maybe it would be a lot higher than if they just picked it out of a a bowl full of random drugs, right? Yeah. Maybe an interesting example that came out recently was uh, someone talking about a craniomagnetic uh, stimulation. So they mm-hmm. put these magnets, uh, very strong magnets next to your skull. Yeah. And some people report that this uh, helps with depression or ver- various other um, yep. mental health issues. Yeah. And I think so- many people look at this and think that it's kind of ridiculous and they have a very low prior that it's true. But I'm just like, well, I mean, we know that the brain, like, we know that it affects the brain. We can like see that. We can see that it's causing particular neurons to fire. Um, so like, is it really that unlikely that this could have, um, a, you know, a positive effect, uh, somehow on, um, people's brains? I guess it's, it's surprising, but it's not crazy surprising. Right. I wouldn't put it, you know, one in 10,000. Exactly. But yeah. I wouldn't put it 50%. Right. Know? It's like maybe more like one in a hundred, one in a thousand. Yeah. It's, not, it's some, something like that, yeah. I would imagine. Yeah. And then, you know, and then they, there are studies that, you know, they come out with, you know, N equals 20. Hmm. And they say that people, you know, 30% improvement in depression. It's like, well, you know, what do you make of that? How do you, you know, how, how basically it's like how much do you trust that, that scientific process yeah. that they're carrying out? Yeah. And, and then so what's going on in these cases where I think uh, it kind of has to be fraudulent or uh, people, people deceiving themselves. So if you've got the, yeah, like the faith healer or someone who's like, yeah, laying hands on people. Like, yeah. I guess, so one thing is I'm starting with, uh, the reference class that this falls in is very bad <laughs> because, uh, so often I think historically, uh, this has been kind of a gurus or, yeah, people doing, um, uh, dodgy stuff. Uh, so you might start with a low prior in that case. So the prior yeah. is very, like, well, the prior is low because I don't think that, yeah, touching people is going to cure, like, many of these conditions that people might claim. Uh, then it looks even worse because I look around and say, oh, yeah, like, there is a long history of people deceiving themselves about this, uh, this kind of thing about, yeah, um, like, yeah, excessive medical claims that are kind of implausible on their face. 
And then typically the evidence in its favor is, seems also really weak because they don't have control groups. So it's not a properly designed study. So it's just like was low, gets even lower. And then I don't really update on people saying that it works for them or like, well, I believe that it kind of does psychologically, but I don't believe necessarily it's going to cure cancer or yeah. There was a, a meta analysis that was done um, looking at the, the power of placebos. Hmm. And a lot of people don't realize this, but when people talk about the effects of placebos, they hmm. actually often aren't really talking about just placebos. Yeah. There's a whole, like, so, you know, let's say they do an intervention, like give someone a drug, and then they have a placebo group, and the placebo group gets quite a bit better. Hmm. People will say, oh, the placebo effect. But a lot of that could be things that are not the placebo effect. Hmm. For example, it might be that the disease tends to improve on its own, hmm. on average. Or it might be that there's a reversion to the mean. Like yeah. you, you go to the doctor, you enroll in the study when you get particularly sick, which is actually above your average and like you're going to mean revert on average. Mm-hmm. Um, or there could be a reporting bias effect. Like you, you feel like you're supposed to tell the doctor you're feeling better or you notice you feel your better feelings once you start becoming aware of them, but you're not actually doing better. So we tend to very, uh, very often lump all these things and call these a placebo. No, mm-hmm. that's not a placebo. The placebo is a very specific effect where believing the thing actually makes you feel better. Yeah. I'll link to a, to a great blog post that um, outlines the evidence that a lot of what we call placebo is just regression to the mean, that people come in for treatment when they're doing particularly badly, and then they just tend to improve always on average. Yeah. So there's this great study that actually analyzed placebo effect ver- versus weightless control mm. in studies that happen to have like three study arms, like intervention, uh, placebo, and weightless control. Mm. And th- that actually lets you begin to say, well, how big is the actual placebo effect mm. without these other factors? Yeah. Yeah. I think you get the... The biggest actual placebo effect when you just ask people after the thing, do you feel better now? Or like, yeah, uh, yeah. So I think subjective that, judgment. I think they found that on uh, subjective judgments that are continuous, like hmm. on a one to ten scale, how bad do you feel or how much pain do you feel? That was where they found the strongest placebo effect. Hmm. It's still weaker, I think, in this study than a lot of people think it hmm. is. But they did find it when they, they didn't tend to find it on things that were like objective measures, like heart rate or that kind of thing. There, hmm. they just didn't. They couldn't even really detect it. So interesting. Okay, so this is a big diversion from Theranos. Um, some of your friends uh, thought that it was uh, not not a legitimate technology early on. Kind of, uh, what what updating did they do there? Uh, do you know that they, they gave it away to them? Well, one thing is that uh, Theranos kept saying they were going to release their product mm. and kept not releasing it, and this went years and years. You know, if you heard the phrase vaporware, yeah, you know, this was like one of the biggest vaporware cases for. I think it was it ten years till they got their product to market, mm. something like that. Yeah, uh, yeah, something like that. Um, I mean, I don't know that, it, that a proper thing ever really came to market. It was like always, always pretty faulty. Though I'm only part way through the book, so maybe I'll find out. <laughs> okay, so so their thing there was, it's a it's a big claim. They claim them to be able to do something that many people think is very hard, and that other other companies mm-hmm. are not close to being able to do. So um, the chances of them succeeding at doing it, perhaps, is a better thing to say. Uh, maybe you already think it's like ten percent, twenty percent. But then, but then at the beginning, they claim that they can do it already or they're like extremely optimistic about it. So maybe you then update in favor and you're like 40%, 50% likelihood that they'll do it. But then like years go by, they don't really publish papers. The, uh, the product is never actually released. And you're like, well, now this is falling into a pretty bad reference class here of companies that claim to be able to do something and then just go years without ever releasing it. Uh, like kind of eight out of 10 times, it's actually just because it's bullshit. Right. And so actually this leads to kind of like another somewhat more advanced way of using the base factor, which is we've been talking about using it to compare uh, a hypothesis to not that same hypothesis. Mm-hmm. Right. So the question of evidence being how likely am I to see this evidence that the hypothesis is true relative to if it's false. But another way to use it is to compare any two hypotheses. Mm-hmm. You could say, how likely am I to see this evidence if hypothesis one is true compared to if hypothesis two is true. Mm-hmm. And then the, the prior there would be the odds of hypothesis, your prior odds of hypothesis one versus hypothesis two. Hmm. So you're going to multiply those prior odds times the base factor huh. to compare the two hypotheses. And so there you could have one hypothesis is that maybe they're just like not very competent hmm. and another hypothesis that they're fraudulent and you can actually try to do a base factor on the relative strength of evidence towards those two hypotheses. Yeah. Okay. Uh, can, can we just try to do that here? So let's say that I, I originally thought there was a 40% chance that they would release a product that was able to do what they what they claimed, you know, within 10 years. And then five years go by and they've released nothing. Um, yeah, what, what would be the base factor here? Well, so I think what? I think if they, cont- they kept claiming, oh, mm. the technology is ready, we're about to release it, and mm. kept not releasing it, to me, that pushes more in the direction of fraud than in okay. the direction of incompetence. Mm. Whereas, whereas if, on the other hand, if maybe if early on they said, we're going to have this done in one year... Mm. And then it didn't come out in one year and it kept going by, but they didn't keep reclaiming that oh, it's, I see. then maybe that pushes more in the comp. Like, mm. you know, they thought they could do it, but it's, it's really, it's not even necessarily in comments, but just really hard. Maybe they're not up to the challenge. Hmm. How confident were your friends that something dodgy was going on? 
Uh, pretty confident, some of them. Yeah. Interesting. And there were interesting message board discussions going on for years where people would say, you know, I'm a person who works in, in biology and I think this is like completely implausible the way they're claiming they're doing this. And mm. so, there, you know, I, I can't, I, I'm not an expert in that topic, so I couldn't really evaluate those claims, but there were certainly people making those claims for a long time. Are there any other, you know, interesting updates uh, that, that we could try to work through for this case? Uh, well, one thing that is kind of interesting is that my understanding is that they didn't really get Silicon Valley investors in it. Mm. And I don't know why that is. I don't know whether that's because Silicon Valley investors invalued it and they're like, I don't know, I don't want to take part of this. Or whether uh, it's just the, the network that, you know, mm. uh, the CEO had was, was a different network. Maybe it was they just thought unusual. it was too far out their area. The, the Silicon Valley people. Are, oh, this is too but they invest in bi- biotech okay. a lot. So mm, okay. it, it does raise an interesting question, I think. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. So the fact that, yeah, they, they were talking to lots of investors and yeah, uh, some of the ones you might expect to invest didn't suggest that there's some red flags here, potentially. Potentially. So I can let you go, but um, a listener had a, a, a final question for you, uh, which was, well, hopefully listening to all of this, we've made people a little bit more rational or at least given them the illusion of being a bit more rational. And someone was wondering, uh, the more that they've tried to be rational about the world and about uh, issues that people have a lot of strong feelings about, kind of the more alienated they, they feel from other people who, who I think, especially in politics, they think aren't trying to form accurate beliefs. And, and they, they, I guess their views have become uh, idiosyncratic and unusual, and they just don't feel that much affinity with their, with their family and friends who perhaps uh, still have more mainstream beliefs that they regard as irrational. Yeah. How do, how do you kind of cope with that alienation? And do, do you experience it yourself? Well, one thing that I've tried to do is really train myself to have a kind of smoke detector alarm that goes off when certain kind of bad arguments are made, hmm. you know, certain types of rhetorical fallacies or cognitive, like things that might indicate cognitive biases or just bad argumentation or statistical fallacies. And I think that's super useful in trying to figure out what the way the world is, because you kind of have these alarm bells that are like, that's not a valid argument. That's not a valid argument. Hmm. But it can be frustrating then once you've train yourself to do this. If you're talking to people who are not using good argumentation, mm. it can be annoying because it kind of like those bells keep going off. And you can't interrupt them just constantly. It'd be so rude and you'd never get anywhere. Yeah. yeah, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be productive. But I think a mindset switch that can be really useful in this case is just because someone is making like not a great argument for a thing doesn't mean the thing that they're saying is not true, mm. right? A bad argument doesn't make something false. That's the fallacy fallacy. Yeah. <laughs> and they might still have valuable things they're saying. And so I like to try to, you know, give when, when someone's making an argument to me, I like to try to give them the benefit of the doubt. Mm. Even if they're making some, you know, they have some missteps in the logic, mm. there might still be something there and trying to and trying to, you know, you know, this phrase of steel manning, mm. trying to think about like, OK, if I really try to strengthen their argument, what does it say and what can I learn from that? Mm. You know, and an example of this is, you know, most startups fail. Mm. So if someone comes to you with their startup idea. You could just say, ah, oh, you're gonna, you're probably gonna <laughs> fail and just dismiss it, but you might miss out on some really great ideas, you know, the ones that are actually really good. Mm. Um, and so you can actually, uh, you know, I think it can be more helpful to say, what's the best thing about this idea? Mm. Not, you know, are there flaws in the, in the way it's being presented to me? Yeah. Yeah, I think that's that's extremely helpful. So that, that that's good if you're talking with someone who's making some mistakes, but also has a lot of wisdom to share. What about uh, what about when things that something's just an absolute uh, epistemic disaster? Uh, I guess I guess there, I just I mean, it's a it's a mad world out there, but I, I do just try to laugh at it. If, if you can reframe things, as, I mean, if you lower your expectations, because just uh, actually trying to be rational, as we've described, is so difficult. There's like so many steps you have to go through, and most people like I mean, who really has the time to be estimating these base factors for everything? It's not surprising that uh, that we get things wrong. Uh, and if your expectations are low, then you can find mistakes potentially quite hilarious and absurd uh, rather than aggravating. Well, I, you know, I think it'd be useful to remember that our brains are not rational machines, right? Mm. You know, we're never going to be rational, but there can be a lot of value in incrementally pushing forward, clearing our thinking as much as possible, trying to find our biases. And that can help us live better lives. It can help us make better predictions. It can help us help the future because we can we can actually think carefully about what can we how can we do more good, right? Mm. And um, so I think it's worth it. But if we remind ourselves that we are all irrational, hmm. that can help us have more empathy for others and say, you know what? OK, that person is saying silly things. But like I've been in that place before. I've said silly things before. You know, maybe one day they'll, you know, they'll have better arguments for the things they're saying. My guest today has been Spencer Greenberg. Thanks for coming on the podcast. Spencer. Thanks so much for having me. There's a bunch of really interesting links in the blog post attached to this episode. Is the placebo effect real? Is power posing legit? Is it a myth that spinach has lots of iron or is it a myth that it's a myth? You can find out by clicking through to the post about this episode and scrolling down to the section with links to articles discussed in the episode. Oh, and you should definitely give Spencer's Common Misconceptions quiz a go. I really enjoyed doing it. The 80,000 Hours podcast is produced by Kieran Harris. Thanks for joining. Talk to you next week.